good morning and welcome to the third meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I wish to remind everyone present to switch off electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four and five in private. Uh, are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is um, to take evidence from two panels on the environmental implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU. The first panel, uh, I want to welcome back uh, Professor Colin Reid from the University of Dundee, Professor Gavin Little, uh, Professor of Environmental and Public Law, and Dr Annalisa Savaresi, Lecturer of Environmental Law at the University of Stirling. Good morning. Um, as you can imagine, we have a series of questions, so we'll get straight into those if, if uh, that's okay. Where, can I ask where you believe the UK and Scottish governments currently are uh, in the process of developing the necessary common frameworks to cover environmental issues post-Brexit, and what do you believe needs to happen in the coming year? hard to say where we are. What we're faced with is essentially unfinished business from the devolution settlements from the 1990s, that because there were the EU frameworks in place, we never really thought hard about how we operate to get on, on a UK basis between the four different administrations. We haven't really sorted out how we deal with the fact that the UK government departments are both the UK departments in terms of international but also the English departments internally because of the constraints posed created by the EU frameworks we would never had to think hard about how we control divergence fragmentation within the UK so we've almost sort of got two different dimensions going on just now one is the short-term need to get sorted out environmental and other sectoral frameworks. The other is actually big long-term constitutional issues because whatever happens in the next few years, we're trying to put down arrangements that in 10, 15, 20 years' time, when governments may be very different, something that will work for that stage. Where we are in terms of the private discussions between the governments, those of us outside don't know. We had hoped that the debates on the EU withdrawal bill would have given us some thinking of ways forward, but with that, with the amendments delayed until the Lord's stage, we're at a loss. Well, certainly I'm at a loss. I shouldn't, shouldn't speak for my colleagues. I feel they're much better informed than I am. I, I don't think so uh, in that context. Um, yes, I, I agree uh, very much with uh, what uh, Professor Reid has said. I mean, in, on the one hand, what we're doing here is, is reacting, I suppose, in, in, a, in a fairly ad hoc way to, to what's happening in the Brexit context. But uh, what we're also having to deal with is a pretty um, important and significant uh, development of the devolution settlement uh, on, on the hoof, as it were. Um, so in that context, I think that the uh, joint communique of, of, the, uh, of the JMC in October is, is a, a a good starting point, uh, but uh, we shouldn't underestimate uh, the nature and scale of, of what lies ahead of us, because we are, in a sense, um, engaged in a, a pretty significant bit of heavy lifting in terms of actual constitutional reform. Okay. Uh, I second entirely what the colleagues just said, and not to repeat the very valid points they made, I would just like to add that it's, I think it's important to distinguish between the urgent questions that need to be tackled as soon as possible because we are, there are uncertainties as to what the transition period will entail for this specific subject area. So there are urgent decisions that need to be taken ahead of March 2019 regarding the EUTS, regarding fluorinated gases and the number of issues that have been flagged by a number of colleagues across the country. And then the longer, medium, longer term decisions on exactly who will be doing what and how. Given the scale of the task at hand, both in the short term and the longer term, how concerned are you about how much work has to be done in a relatively short space of time? I think it would be uh, appropriate to be concerned, but I think a great deal depends on the uh, political will uh, and the determination of the four governments of the UK. 
uh, or I suppose three at the moment, because uh, Northern Ireland, of course, is without a devolved government, to um, to roll up their sleeves and, and do do the work that needs to be done, uh, which will be significant, both in terms of I think um, making organisational arrangements, but also I think in terms of developing the degree of political trust and consensus that's going to be necessary to, to build uh, sustainable and robust uh, constitutional structures. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, specific issues, and you've touched on a few already, what would you identify as the most critical environmental areas or issues where Scotland should be particularly concerned about ensuring a coordinated approach to environmental policy between Scotland and the rest of the UK? If you were to sort of create your list of priorities. I mean, uh, I think it's very important to get extremely clear the message that different areas are governed and regulated in different ways today. Uh, this is a result of an overlap between international law, EU, and domestic law measures. Now, every single area needs to be looked at carefully in its own merits, because even within the same subject area, there are areas that will need to be tackled urgently with Brexit and other areas where um, issues can pretty much continue as they are. Um, I do not know if you read the evidence that was submitted to the UK Parliament in relation to an inquiry on fluorinated gases and the regulation in the UK post-Brexit. There we had two different EU instruments that were implemented in different ways. One could continue as, we, as usual, with some concerns relating to proper implementation of EU law, but nevertheless, the governance apparatus and regulations were there, the other wasn't. And it's exactly that exercise that needs to take place. And it's really a very large exercise. I know the Scottish government is in the process of doing this. I know Jeffra is in the process of doing this, but it's very hard to tell, here's the list, because the list doesn't exist yet. It's being produced, and there is clearly a great degree of urgency in producing that list and knowing what to do. I think just to follow that up, there's different scales of urgency in that for some things there's an immediate technical need to put something in place to replace uh, an EU element that's going to be disappearing, but that doesn't have any necessarily have any particular policy substantive content, whereas there are other areas where politically, socially, economically it's important to have either a united policy or scope for divergence where that's beneficial. And as has been said, every area needs to be looked at individually and indeed within each area. There may be some points where you do need a common framework for commercial economic interests, but that can operate within a, a wider policy. I mean, as one example, if you take something like packaging waste, the recycling rate in the different parts of the UK, the target recycling rate could be quite different. But for commercial reasons, you might want to have the same rules on the making of packaging, what different, what combination of materials you can have in that. So even just in that one little area, you may be talking about different, different frameworks. And then you get to the questions, well, who should decide what the common standards are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning. Um, so much to do about Brexit, so little time to do it. And so do the panel have any views on how many common frameworks covering environmental policy areas require to be sorted, revised, updated, improved? Established, Established yes, thank you. I may believe the decision on frameworks is both political and technical. So there is two elements playing out there. So there may be a number of areas where you receive advice um, in relation to, as we said already, UTS, fluorinated gases, chemicals. Um, but in the end of the day, it's down to politicians to make those political decisions as to how to address this topic. So it's very hard for us to provide an informed guess, for sure. There are many areas that need to be addressed. The issue is how you decide to address these issues, and that's largely a political decision. 
that are working to this from a very early stage. And I'm sure you have views of your own, and it would be interesting to tease those out. Um, yeah, I welcome the evidence you've given, but I'm sure you, you can go beyond that and outline for us what you think. I think in, in that context, uh, when we're talking about frameworks, we have to think quite clearly about what we mean by frameworks. I mean, if, for example, we're talking about frameworks in the context of governance structures, uh, as opposed to environmental subject areas, you, you get a slightly different um, uh, perspective, I think, depending on how you how you approach uh, th that issue. But if we were if we look at it, uh, think of frameworks, common frameworks in terms of governance structures. Um, in my sense, uh, at any rate, is that the most obvious way of, of organising uh, common frameworks would be within the context of a statutorily based system, uh, uh, which draws on the, the basic features of the design that we have already uh, within the European Union uh, for its decision-taking processes. And in terms of um, common framework areas, uh, Different subject areas could be um, divided into perhaps subunits of, or councils um, according to ex officio ministerial remits, rather like uh, the situation that we have at the moment um, with the European uh, Council of Ministers. So you could, for example, have um, a fisheries and agriculture council, um, and an environment and climate change council, and, and, and so on. Uh, but that's just one suggestion. There's many different ways in which these frameworks could be um, could be established. And I think that Dr. Savarese is uh, correct to say that fundamentally this is a matter of political organisation. Um, just to follow that up, it depends partly what you mean by a common framework. Is it, the, is it a common end result which could be achieved by having each administration having complete authority over matter but actually doing parallel things to begin with which may well be immediately just carrying over the EU rules? Or are you actually talking about there being a common framework that actually binds the different administrations into the future, that they have agreed that together they are going to do this into the future, or just for the time being, we're all doing the same, the same thing? And that comes back to the, the, structural, the structural issues, I'm afraid. So basically, under the situation, you know, we're looking away from the EU, the EU core, all the different other organisations, do we really need to have our own or set up a organisation? You know, for hundreds of years we've added in different types of laws. Last 40 years we've added in all these EU laws. Do we need to bother? Do we really need to get uptight? I voted to remain, by the way. But really, do we need to get uptight about this? My, my sense is that we don't necessarily need to get uptight about it, but we do need to make proper uh, provision uh, to deal with, with these areas. Um, and I think that the, the reasons for that are in many ways quite plain, because what we're, we're talking about is a, a, an area of, of where, where a retained EU law will intersect with um, the devolved uh, jurisdictions and, and competencies. And if those areas are to be dealt with uh, appropriately and in a structured way, there does require to be, uh, there do require to be structures and processes in, in place in order to do that. And I think that although I'm, I'm personally certainly not uh, in favour of sort of gold plating anything or setting up sort of grand institutions or anything of that nature, I think that it's useful to think in terms of what the EU currently does in terms of the basic function of these institutions and organisations, and then think to ourselves, well, how can we replicate that uh, within a scaled down, narrowed down uh, UK context? so that we have effective decision-taking and effective policy-making uh, in these areas. Because otherwise, there is, I think, the real risk that uh, it could either be ineffective, just not very thorough in terms of doing the job that it needs to do. And, and some of the areas, although they're not necessarily particularly controversial, they are, as issues, quite complex. And they will require quite a lot of work to be done to 
get into the, the guts of the different subjects and to really understand it and produce good quality policy and good quality, uh, good quality law. Um, some of it, though, may well be uh, uh, the sort of subject matter which, unless it's dealt with within the context of an established structure, could quite easily, I think, result in sort of cross-border constitutional politics. Um, which may be appropriate in, 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 in one context, but from an environmental perspective might actually deflect away from consideration of the, the, what are actually the environmental issues. Um, so for those reasons, and given the weight um, that obviously attends anything to do with, with the Constitution and the nature of the devolution settlement, I think that we do need to have properly constituted statutory uh, structures and processes. If I may ask um, a brief point, uh, there is also, I believe, a need to be uptight about some things um, which are really urgent, as I already mentioned. And to go back to the example of fluorinated gases, there is an HFC registry that is being managed by the EU presently, allocates quotas to businesses directly within the EU. It will not service the UK in all likelihood after March 2019, so what do you do? And this was the concern that was raised by businesses at the hearing before the UK Parliament in December. What do we do? We have spent money to comply with these regulations. And in the end of the day, if we are not compliant, we will never be able to export to the EU market again. At the same time, we could become a dump yard for cheap, substandard Chinese products that don't comply with these rules at home. So there are a number of issues there that need to be tackled urgently, and there is a need to be uptight about those, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Alec Rowley. Could I go back to the point or the example Professor Reid gave, where he talked about um, common standards, and he talked the example he gave was the packaging of plastics. A starting point, or is a starting point, not that the four nations should at this point have the same standards in place if we've been complying with EU regulation. And therefore, we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper that, that the four nations should be in that position right now. Uh, so those examples, if you if you accept that the starting point is, is the current EU regulations, and I suppose the concern that many people have is that we start to see pressure coming on and some of the nations to relax some of the standards and regulations that are there. But is that a starting point, the EU current regulations? Because we should all be the same, as it were. The starting point is the same, but you could have pressure both ways. One administration wanting higher standards that causes trouble for industries, manufacturers, <laughs> retailers that are wanting to sell across the UK. Or you could have the other way, one administration in favour of deregulation wanting to reduce costs on industry and so on, and having lower standards at the other parts of the the UK don't accept. Now, that may happen in two years' time, five years' time, 10, 20 years' time. What, what is going to happen when, when those differences do arise? How are we going to say in these matters all bits of the UK have to be the same, or are we going to say, well, we need to agree that, or is each part going to be able to go their own way? And it's trying to work out a structure for dealing with that. In a sense, we're in a good place to begin, because we're all beginning at the same point, rather than trying to come together from different, from different places to agree. But we should try and take advantage of that capital at present, that we are in the same place, to work out what's going to happen when things get harder in the future. So given, just finally, given, given the pressures that, that are on government and so many areas uh, with, with Brexit, would it be a realistic view for governments to be able to agree the status quo and put it in place for a period of time so perhaps the pressure is not as great to, to try and deal with everything because it's clearly the case we're not going to be able to? So would that be a, a realistic proposition to say that, that, that in many areas we simply agree the status quo until there is a time to work through these? I think that's fine. There's a question about whether we, if EU issues change to be changed with them during the, the standstill period, but whether, whether the different elements would agree to that without certainty as to what the future arrangements are going to be, I mean, again, it comes back, I'm afraid, to a political decision. And the word you used earlier, trust. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Professor Little, I think you have answered my question already, but 
I just observed that the EU itself provides a model uh, for how this could be done, insofar as you have the Commission as an enforcement agency, you have the ECJ as adjudicator, you have a number of member states with different priorities. And I suppose my question is, how much would you take from that model? And if you could take quite a lot from it, um, do you sense this being as difficult as some might um, have us believe? Um, well, I suppose the, the, the amount that one would have to take from the EU model, if, if you're going to, to alight on it, I suppose depends to quite a considerable extent on the nature of the Brexit that actually emerges. Because if we have a situation where um, the UK, perhaps as a future, in terms of, of a future trade agreement with the EU, agrees to comply with much EU environmental law, then yes, there will need to be structures and processes, but they'll be, they'll be focused uh, primarily, much as they are at the moment in some respects, on implementation of, of EU uh, provisions. Um, but if we're, if we're in a situation where there's the, the, the so-called hard Brexit and uh, we're not required to be compliant uh, with EU law, then I think that we do have to think about, um, as I said, I, I wouldn't, would not be in favour of gold plating uh, some sort of uh, constitutional arrangement, but we do need to have basic mechanisms that ensure, first of all, effective uh, executive action by government and, and, and we need to have a, a secretariat that can support that, that's independent of the different administrations. Um, there needs to be some sort of adjudicatory mechanism um, and there needs uh, also to be uh, proper oversight and scrutiny by the different legislatures. As to whether or not that is, is difficult, I think that Again, it comes down to this issue of political trust and political consensus. I think if, if political trust and consensus can be established across the, the different uh, governments and parliaments, it shouldn't necessarily be that difficult. I mean, that's not to say that it wouldn't be a fairly substantial piece of work, but I don't think it would be uh, too difficult. But it's, it's the question is, is the trust there? Can consensus be built? You know, and good morning to you all. I've got a specific question. I'm not sure where to put it, so I'm going to ask it now. Um, in terms of the emissions uh, trading scheme, uh, and which obviously is EU-wide, like all of them, but uh, do you have a, a specific view and a view on how that might be taken forward and how it would interface with um, the EU? Um, there is a number of things to be said about emission trading schemes. And the first is that you don't necessarily need to have one if you don't want one anymore. Uh, the emission trading scheme of the European Union has, it has received its share of criticism over the years, and some of them can be divided and can be uh, really supported. So uh, there is a first political decision for you to make. Do you want to continue with emission trading after Brexit or not? If you decide to do that, there could be a UK-wide scheme. That would probably be the more rational thing to do. Um, but Scotland could have its own emission trading scheme. Um, it's not unheard of. Um, it can happen. As you may have also heard, um, the EU is in talks with California presently on ways to join its emission trading scheme with that of the European Union. So it was unheard of until recently that some national entities join up with the emission trading scheme, but it's not anymore. Now, we don't know where those negotiations will go, but in principle, Scotland could, at the technical level, do that. The issue is, does it have the constitutional powers to do this? This is another question that goes back to the issues of devolution that we discussed earlier. And I guess we are in uncharted waters here. So it's one of the many things that the administrations would have to discuss if Scotland was adamant to continue with emission trading on its own and the rest of the UK decided not to bother anymore. Do you see a, a, a different way forward, like a, some form of sort of carbon tax that's different to a, a trading scheme? or? Because it needs to be recognised what, you know, what, what contribution to our emissions is. Yes, I completely agree. There needs to be something. If you don't do emission trading anymore, what do you do instead? Because we're talking about 
a policy tool that tackles presently the largest emitters, the most polluting industries. Therefore, there needs to be something. This is one of those areas where we need to be uptight. Uh, because as of March 2019, there needs to be absolute certainty as to what will happen to these polluters. So either you continue with emission trading, uh, try to continue with the status quo for a period of time, and ideally up until 2020 when the present commitment period la uh, finishes, and then decide what to do after then. But if you don't do that, a carbon tax will be the obvious replacement. And of course, it needs to be engineered in a way that does the same job, if not a better job, than emission trading in terms of putting the incentives in the right place for these polluters to continue reducing their emissions, adopting best available technologies, and so on. Thank you. OK, well, let's move this on and look at the principles of the common frameworks that we're talking about. Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wondered what your views were on the uh, common principles that have been established through the early JMC communique and whether you feel those are adequate. Um, do you have any concerns about uh, what's in there? Is, there? is there anything missing? I think it's a, a good starting point. Um, it's very much uh, a pragmatic approach. And I think that um, as things develop, one would hope to see uh, the inclusion of uh, a more principle-based uh, way of thinking. Uh, perhaps, for example, in the context of the creation of what I called in my paper the, a governing statute um, to, uh, to regulate uh, the system. And in that sort of context, it would be possible to start to introduce um, broad statements of principle or statements of intent in terms of how the, uh, the different administrations and parliaments propose um, that the, the common framework should, should operate. So um, ideas such as subsidiarity, precautionary principle, uh, and so on could perhaps be included in that sort of context. Okay. It may... Um, expand on that point. I believe that in this specific subject area, of course, there is a number of principles that we know as principles of environmental law that come from various different sources, national, EU law, international law. And it's important to realize that they will just not go away with Brexit, but those embedded in EU law may. So it's very important that we look at those EU environmental law principles that we want to carry forward with Brexit. And the Scottish government has expressed a clear opinion in this connection. The issue is to understand what they mean exactly by that. And the principle of subsidiarity is a very good example because this is a principle of EU constitutional law. It's not a principle of EU environmental law. So what would be its fate after Brexit? We don't know. I think the way you would look for the polluter pace principle to be involved in that as well. Yes, and perhaps the polluter pace principle is a good example that it's important that any of these environmental principles are set in a, against an ambition of a high level of environmental protection because polluter pays can in some circumstances become, well, if the polluter is willing to, to pay, they can put out as much as they want. So it only operates as a principle within the, the guiding objective of maintaining or achieving a high, high level of environmental protection particular area, and that's trade. Um, aware that for the UK government to uh, establish and re-establish the, the kind of trading arrangements that we have at the moment within the EU, we're going to need to uh, negotiate potentially up to 36 trade deals uh, with other, other trading blocks around, around the world. Um, do, do you see particular principles in terms of the way that trade deals are, are negotiated that need to be reflected within these underlying principles on, on the common frameworks around trade. And I, I would cite the recent CETA uh, EU trade deal where it does appear that, um, at least at the other Canadian end, there was quite strong involvement from provincial governments in, in the eventual position of the, of the Canadian, uh, Canadian government in, in that deal. So there does seem to be an element there of uh, involvement of uh, devolved administrations and, and federal governments. 
internal workings of the, the Canadian constitutional arrangement, but in terms of the trade agreements, you are seeing happily now in these agreements some references to environmental objectives, environmental principles, making sure that uh, you can't deregulate to undercut environmental standards and so on. So you'd be looking for some such broad principles, broad objectives to be in any, any trade agreement. Worth pointing out that the the provisions which are in, they're now in uh, the treaty and the functioning of the European Union. I think it's Articles 191 uh, to 193 were inserted into EU treaty law by the Single European Act 1986, uh, and the environmental uh, title in that was, of course, largely uh, the creation of of the UK government at the time. So what we now consider to be key EU principles were in. in, in to a very considerable extent, derived from uh, UK policy thinking. Um, I do believe that um, many civil society organizations have already pointed out this issue that you raise here, uh, the fact that future trade deals may become a vehicle to open up the UK market to lower standards in terms of environmental protection as far as products are concerned. So that's definitely a concern I would share uh, and that's definitely something that needs to be kept on the horizon, for sure. But that's, again, a matter of political mandate in the context of those negotiations that are yet to come. How, how do you believe that um, a common framework should operate around trade across the UK? How should it involve devolved, devolved administrations and citizens' movements and others? I mean, this is a, one of those interesting opportunities, uh, at least from an academic point of view, to do some comparative constitutional work and see how other uh, federal or regional states deal with this specific matter. Um, we know we have interesting examples both within and outside the EU. Uh, Canada is one of them, Belgium is another. So there is clearly a, a, a need there to look at what are the examples that do exist and how the UK may take heed from these examples. Yes, I mean, you've got, you've got a spectrum from the sort of traditional UK position, which would be that the central government decides everything and has a completely free hand to do that towards something like the, the Belgian example, the obvious one where the, the different provinces have very strong, say, almost a veto on, on what's happening. And it is, you know, we have to decide where we want to sit on that spectrum, what is the level of involvement by the devolved administrations that is desirable, acceptable, and so on. And then separately to that, there's the issue of stakeholders' public participation in policy is using the, the standard mechanism of executive accountability to parliament adequate to achieve the level of input we think there should be. It's important just to always keep in, in, in the back of uh, one's mind that what we're talking about here are common frameworks that are uh, established to deal with um, the areas where retained EU law intersects with devolved competence, not more, more general um, aspects of trade. Okay. Thank you. Um, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. And I can I begin by declaring an interest of someone likely to be affected by the outcomes of all of these discussions as a landowner? Um, two, can I thank you very much for the preparation of these detailed and elegant papers? Uh, much appreciated. Um, I want to ask you about the development of the common frameworks, if, if I may, and what challenges does Scotland in particular face in developing, agreeing and implementing common frameworks? Have we the capacity to do it, for example, um, given that we haven't had the responsibility in Scotland for doing this, given, as you said earlier, uh, Professor Reid, that this was something that was done by the European Union historically and before that by the UK administrations and DEFRA. Um, have we the capacity, for example, and I'll ask you other questions. I think it varies from sector to sector that in some areas, the, Scotland has a strong base, has the expertise to do it. In other areas, we have been, I suspect, fairly reliant on uh, 
what's happening elsewhere if there are, to the extent there are standards in areas that aren't, haven't been important for the Scottish economy, Scottish industry, and so on. Understandably, we probably have taken a, more of a, a back seat. And initially, if you're talking about just rolling over EU standards, that's not a problem because you can then plan and look ahead to what's going on. If you're going to have joint working within the UK, you can share expertise, either people, groups working to get expert groups working together or a de facto arrangement, okay, you look after that, you, you take the lead on this subject, we'll take the lead, the lead on this. The, I say to the extent that things are rolled over, it may not be an immediate issue, but I think it needs a lot of thought, what's going to happen in the future, where are we going to have to develop our own strategies or work with others to develop them? Uh, yes. If I might just add a quick point on that, um, I think it's important to realise also the capacity building is taking place in London as well as within the both administrations. Unfortunately, the situation is such that there is a number of governance arrangements that were managed directly by Brussels and presently this means that there is an urgent need to do capacity building across the board, not just here. And, uh in that context, I think that uh, now is probably the time to think, start thinking about how um, a UK-wide secretariat that's independent of the different administrations might usefully operate in the areas in which it might usefully operate. Uh, you spoke earlier of political trust um, and for the self-evident reason at the very least of avoiding duplication of effort it would be valuable. But is there an obvious and an ordered structure, if you like, that immediately occurs to you as to how uh, either at a Scottish level we might develop our capacity for um, this further work? Uh, divergence is inevitable over time. Um, even if we start from a common position. So is there an obvious structure or framework that you see that would spring out at you um, that you could write down for us almost um, either at a UK level or a Scottish level? I'm afraid there isn't a simple answer to that. I think a lot depends on working on the basis of the often very good working relationships that there are at the technical, at the, the frontline level, that there are expert groups that work together, there are organisations that draw together the different bodies that across the UK on environmental matters. And at the, at the technical level, we are just dealing with that. Cooperation is very good and you can build on those. But the structures for those are different in different areas. Sometimes it is based on some statutory provisions, some statutory arrangements. Sometimes it's just ad hoc arrangements. Sometimes it's a sort of offshoot of a presently European arrangement. So again, I'm afraid it's a question of looking at each individual sector and seeing what can, what's already there, what's working well, how far that can, how far up the sort of policy level that can get before you actually need to take political decisions. Are you optimistic that the political will either exists or will develop? Um, for that type of framework to be put in place at a political level to allow the, the specific um, detail to be argued out where collaboration already exists? I suspect that as a matter of pragmatism and practicality, as you know, leaving the experts to get on with as much as everybody's happy with is going to be the, the way forward, but there, there will come crunch points and they become part of this, what we've talked about, this wider constitutional structural issue because I suspect that the different administrations don't want to give a hostage to fortune, don't want to concede something in one area, even though it may make short-term sense if that's seen as creating a precedent for what might happen in the future in more controversial areas. Thank you. Following on from this, we have a, a session with stakeholders, um, but I want to touch on... on their role in this briefly. Um, have you identified any concerns or do you hold any concerns uh, around a, a potential scenario where external stakeholders might be concerned that the position the Scottish Government might want to take around standards within frameworks and try to circumvent the devolution process by going direct to the UK Government to encourage an approach that sees unanimity a level playing field across the UK. Is that something that you've <coughs> considered? 
who are here as well as many other areas in uncharted waters. So um, you know that civil society organizations have raised strongly the point about concerns on enforcement of environmental law post Brexit. And this is an issue that affects all administrations, clearly not only the UK administration. Now, what you will have after Brexit on this specific point, we really don't know. Uh, there's going to be a consultation on this issue. It's going to be, a, I assume, a very lively consultation because very strong ideas have already been developed in this connection. And Professor Reid has already contributed importantly to this debate. I think the issue is really one of, um, again, making the most of a constitutional opportunity that you have here uh, to actually engage in a dialogue as to where the power should lie who should exercise what powers and when. Okay. And I think that if you're a, an interest group, whether it's for higher or lower standards, you're going to apply the pressure to get the decision you want at whatever level that is. It may be at international level, it may be UK level, it may be the devolved level. So you're going to try to manipulate, you're going to argue for the power to, the, the, the key power to, to rest at the level where you think you're going to, you're going to get the best out of it. But it's another factor in this whole issue of developing trust and taking this process forward. Right, thank you for that. Richard Lyle. Yes, can I, um, I find this very interesting. Can I suggest that everything's back on the table? Am I right in saying that every EU law passed in the last 40 years stays online until it's individually dismantled, replaced, or agreed with uh, different... Uh, um, you know, sections of the UK that we are going to amend it. Am I right in saying that? That's the, that's the current situation in the withdrawal bill, subject to the fact that not everything can be carried over. There are some of them are going to have to be changed, amended, enhanced, added to, in order just simply to make them work. Do you think we'll have a, you know, with the greatest respect to lawyers, we'll have some lawyers going about and saying, we're not in the EU now. So that law doesn't count, Your Honour. Um, we, we can go back to the law that was passed in 1948. The way the withdrawal bill is currently drafted, that will not be possible. possible. Although there are some grey areas about how far some of the case law from the Court of Justice of the European Union will continue to have influence. So yeah. there may be scope for arguing that although the Gordon Luxembourg said this, actually, now we should take a different, a different line. Thank you very much, I just thought I'd ask. Finlay Carson. Professor, you, you suggested it, it's essential for successful operation of the, uh, the, the economy and the market for meaningful, and meaningful protection of the environment to have a coordinated uh, approach across the UK. Now, some of that uh, governance compliance may come down to the Joint Ministerial Committee to decide on. But specifically, what role do you see the, the Scottish Parliament, rather than the Scottish Government, having in the development and scrutiny of these common frameworks? That comes back to, in a sense, the, the structural issue. You can have, if, if the common frameworks are going to be agreed simply executive, executive, then the role of the Scottish Parliament is going to be to monitor, to hold accountable the Scottish executive for what their contribution to the, the discussions. If the common frameworks are a matter for discussion consultation, but ultimately the UK government decides, then it's very hard to see how the Scottish Parliament is going to in, have a role in that. If the agreement, if the frameworks are going to have to be agreed between the executives, then the question is, well, how does the Scottish Parliament hold the executive to account, either in terms of beforehand its negotiating position, what it's going to say in the negotiations, or do you do it afterwards? Do you hold them to, to account afterwards, saying, well, look, this is the agreement that's emerged. This is the common framework that's emerged. We think you were wrong. We want to hold you accountable. And then what happens after that? Can you actually undo the framework? Or do the different assemblies, parliaments get together and say that the framework has to be approved by each of the, each of the parliaments, each of the assemblies, which maximizes the democratic accountability <laughs> but obviously complicates matters as an extra stages. You get issues like the you know, Belgium and the Canadian 
trading with a different assemblies for perhaps for short term different political reasons don't agree to something that holds up something that's been agreed. There's a, an argument between efficiency and accountability. Can I ask, given uh, your work and your experience in this, if you're a crystal ball, what, what are your expectations? What do you expect to, to happen? What, how is the role going to work out for the Scottish Parliament? Can, it, can the, all the committee address that? I find it very hard to predict because for the past however many years, the extent to which the parliaments have controlled what happens at the EU level has been very limited at present, even in terms of implementing EU measures. If an agreement, if the Scottish executive agrees that the UK government is going to legislate, for example, in a matter that combines devolved and reserved competence, the Scottish Parliament doesn't really have much say in controlling or holding accountable that decision, doesn't have any say in the delegated legislation that may be made through, through Westminster to do that. So it's a question of are we simply trying to replicate that fairly hands-off position that the Scottish Parliament has had, or is this being taken as an opportunity to actually increase the level of control accountability for what the executive does in this area? Um, I, I would actually agree with that assessment. I think it's incredibly hard to predict what's going to happen, especially in relation to the bigger constitutional questions that are on the table, which are uh, an opportunity, really, to settle bigger issues that go well beyond the remit of this subject area. And I think the outcome of that constitutional conversation will affect the say of this committee on any other uh, like committee across the UK on the issue of how environmental governance is done after Brexit. Yes, without, without re repeating the same points, I, I agree very much with that. And I think, too, that the Parliament uh, has the opportunity uh, to, uh, if you like, take the initiative, um, because it's such a fluid situation. Uh, it, the Scottish Parliament has the, the opportunity to take the initiative on developing uh, how these structures uh, might actually operate, because I think it is quite a... It's pretty much a blank canvas at the moment. Okay. It's a political vacuum. Right, uh, moving on, John Scott. Thank you. Um, and notwithstanding what you've just said, Dr. Seversi, I mean, the bigger constitutional issues may yet or may not yet be to be resolved, but there's got to be a pragmatic approach from um, next year, March next year. And can you see, um, do you have any views on the appropriate mechanisms for agreeing and monitoring common frameworks um, from day one. We need to have something in place from day one. What should it be? Well, clearly, presently, you will have to rely on existing mechanisms. Um, there is so much to be addressed that I don't imagine you will have a quick fix solution to this, but definitely being engaged in the conversation initiated by Michael Gove in the context of JFRA is going to be important, even if Scotland maintains its own schemes for enforcement, as it should, because it's a separate legal system after all. The issue is what can be drawn from that conversation that is useful for Scotland in understanding what mechanisms can be put in place, given the fact that presently there is an enforcement machinery that will no longer operate after Brexit. Okay. O on the issue of enforcement. Yeah, sorry, sorry uh, if anybody wants to come in on that, or are you, has that covered your position? Yeah. I think it's just that uh, what battlefield is chosen by the different, by the different parties, by the different actors. You know, you could choose an, a high-profile environmental issue as the one that is seen as being the, you know evil London imposing its power on us or as being the shiny example of how all the administrations can work together in friendly and harmony, harmony going forward. And, you know, there are lots of different battlegrounds. That's a sort of conflict, a battle that may arise, either whichever side of the argument you're on. And the environment offers lots of opportunities for that. Or everybody could just think, oh, goodness, we've got to just keep, keep the show on the road. And despite the higher level political issues, just get on with, get on with, making practical things work. Uh, 
That your latter point is probably the, the pragmatic approach to just let's keep it going as we can from a hand-to-mouth basis and we'll mm. deal with the constitutional issues as and when. Um, and therefore, uh, just since you're in front of us, could you put on the record your views on the likely number of st um, pieces of secondary legislation, uh, given that that's your field of expertise? Is there any update on that? We're working I on have basis absolutely no idea because it partly questions. depends how you divide things up. I mean, there are pieces of statutory legislation that are two pages long. There are ones that are almost a thousand pages long. So uh, depending how you, how you divide it up, things could be very different. I think collectively we should declare their interest in that. <laughs> uh, well, the, the Scottish Parliament, I think, is working on the basis of something like maybe a thousand or, or so statutory instruments coming up the road. Have you a view on that? I'd have thought that's not an unreasonable estimate uh, because there will be a lot of minor changes. You could try to do a lot by very general sort of deeming phrases that apply across the board, but that then makes the statute book very hard to, hard, hard to operate. Uh, Donald Cameron. Yes, on the question of enforcement, um, uh, what sort of mechanism, if there is a, 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 a say, a UK-wide common framework, what mechanism of enforcement do you think should exist? My own feeling is that uh, there needs to be a statutory scheme which, amongst other things, makes provision for enforcement. And one could uh, see a situation uh, where uh, there could be means of uh, imposing fines uh, through political mechanisms backed up, if need be, at the end of the day by uh, a judgment of the, of the UK <laughs> Supreme Court. Um, could I return to the question of um, principles? As a matter of law, how would you enshrine, in Scots law, for example, general principles of EU law, be they subsidiarity or be they environmental principles like the precautionary principle, um, polluter pays uh, and other such? My own, my own view is that um, there will need to be some sort of a governing statute uh, and uh, that governing statute would be the probably the most appropriate place to uh, include uh, general principles of that sort. Um, and that would provide them, first of all, uh, with a high degree of legal authority, but would also, I think, be emblematic of the fact, assuming that this legislation was passed by the UK Parliament and also uh, consent granted to it by the, the devolved legislatures, it would be uh, emblematic of a political consensus around those principles. Do any other members of the panel have a view on that? Oh, is that, that simple? Both those issues, the enforcement mechanism depends partly on the, the status of the frameworks. If they're just political frameworks, you wouldn't necessarily want to go down the road of finding and so on. The question is, how are you going to hold the different administrations? How are you going to make sure they comply? If you impose fines, where does the money go? Where is it coming from? Is it just circulating in the public sector? There are issues over that. In terms of the role of principles, they need to appear somewhere in legislation if they're going to have an effect. The question is, in what form are they simply things that have, you have to have regard to? Do you have to expressly show how they're taken into account? Reporting mechanisms such as play a wide and important role in the climate change legislation can be one way of keeping this, of making sure that things are monitored, people are complying, the reporting, if it's public, if it's to the parliaments, you then use the standard political accountability mechanisms rather than creating a whole separate, separate architecture for that. But it all comes back to, well, what's the status, what's the role of the, of the frameworks? How are they, are they, is there enough trust for them to be political agreements or do we want to have formal, legally enforceable matters which create complications and may create uh, obstacles for the future when you want to change things? Um, trying to pin down an example of, of an issue that might arise. So, for example, uh, say one of the devolved administrations took a different view on, for example, a, a herbicide, the, the environmental impact of a herbicide on crops. Um, and that somehow fell out with the common frameworks. Could you sort of play that scenario out in your mind? How, how would we work that out? non-devolved administration, what if it was the UK government? 
Well, under, under the current situation, if it's a matter where the UK government has the power to decide, the competence to deal with it, it would simply make the rule, and that's a, a rule for the UK. If it's a completely devolved matter without a common framework, each administration could do its own thing, so you have the inconsistency, which would cause problems for agriculture, the retail, the, the food sector, and so on. If you have a common framework, the question is, well, are the administrations actually bound by that? If they're bound by it, is it simply a political agreement? So if one administration goes off on its own, there are political consequences, you don't talk to them, it affects other negotiations and so on, or are they actually legally bound to do that, in which case is the, the binding legal obligation such that it invalidates the law which the devolved administration has made in the same way as legislation by the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Executive, that breaches EU law simply is invalid, or is it a different sort of obligation that somehow they've got to, they've got to account for what they've done some way there's a delay in making the law, they've got to go through some extra process or whatever. There are lots of different ways you can do it because a, a legal obligation could bite in different ways. Which brings us back to the question, are the principles enforceable or not as a matter of domestic law? And are the constitutional arrangements enforceable or not? And these are decisions that are yet to be made. From the EU, are you aware of any international examples of enforcement systems that work quite effectively and might be a good model for the UK to adopt? Not an easy question, I accept. I mean, the enforcement of environmental law, <coughs> excuse me, the enforcement of environmental law is a vexed question, not only for the UK, not only within the EU, across the board, unfortunately. So it's important to stay realistic about this and understand that this is a common challenge that is not only facing you presently. Uh, the very contingent situation you're faced with here is that you have a mechanism now that works, could be better, and the issue is to exploit this opportunity to, if you can, make it even better. Now, um, best practices do exist in various sectors. Um, for example, you look at fisheries. If you're talking about fisheries, you want to look at Norway because Norway has been regarded as a fast mover and is a best example of how to manage your fisheries. But it depends on the subject area and it's very hard to tell what is the best uh, for everything, I'm afraid. Commissioner John Scott. Uh, thank you very much. Can, can we drill down a little bit more into the enforcement issue and could I ask you for your own views, each of the panel, on um, whether there's a place for any enforcement within the devolved administration. It obviously depends on what is going to happen um, with the frameworks and everything, but if so, what, what would that body be? And indeed, if it was um, UK-wide, what body would you see as an enforcement um, as the most valuable and useful enforcement um, body. Uh, I, I don't want to s Im imply by this that enforcement is, is sort of be all and end all, but if you look at air pollution and, you know, yet this, we've just done an inquiry on that, for example, and again this week there are more concerns about air pollution and we do need to use the old cliche, um, stick as well as carrot. So I think it's very important and just would like to get more views. I think that one of the things that can usefully be taken from the EU model is the role that the European Commission has in enforcement. And if we were to be able to establish, as for the common framework areas, uh, a UK-wide uh, secretariat that's independent of the different administrations that has a statutory duty to uh, uphold and enforce um, the, uh, the different provisions in place in the um, in those areas, that would I think be if reasonably effective in all likelihood and appropriate. But I do think there there also has to be um, scope for court based adjudication. You know, I think that there needs to be an independent body that has its funding and staffing guaranteed. If you're thinking about how it's going to how it's going to be informed, 
reporting obligations can be very important as a way of making sure executives keep thinking about their, their obligations. The ability to receive complaints, not necessarily an obligation to deal with every complaint, but receiving complaints as a form of information of what's happening. The ability to take issues to the various executives, because an awful lot of the work that the European Commission does just now, the, the few cases that get to the court are the visible ones, but the number of cases that you know, they, they informally speak to the various member state governments and say, well, look, there seems to be an issue here, and just, it's just that bit of pressure, that making government realise it's got to fulfil its obligations, that, and then where there are clear legal obligations, you need to have clear legal remedies, but it's this sort of, this, this big area of just making government realise, hold on, you're not quite doing what you've said you would do. There's a huge area there which is, will be a big gap with the Commission going. The simple fact you know somebody's looking over your shoulder just makes all the difference. And on top of the matter of the policing, there is also, of course, the matter of adjudication. And uh, I'm sure you've heard Professor McCrory from UCL has for many years advocated for the establishment of uh, an environmental court. Now, do you want an environmental court in Scotland or not? I would say there is mixed evidence in support of establishing such courts, what is important to realize is that environmental questions, as you know, can be very technical and specific, so having a specialized court has its advantages, doubtlessly, because we have specialized judges that are only looking at environmental matters. The concern with that is that it's a separate court system, if you like, that may develop case law and jurisprudence that is not necessarily plugged in the holistic um, system or case law, and that has reason some concerns in some places. Opportunity for that to function, or a similar body to function on a UK-wide basis? Or would that go to the Supreme Court? Or It's just views, really, to try and begin to understand where we are. In terms, of where, in terms of where matters end up, you've got to think what sort of dispute it is. You know, the Supreme Court is not the place to be deciding the merits of environmental decision standard setting and so on if you're talking about political, multifaceted political choices between different administrations. Again, courts are probably not the best for that. What you're wanting is some form of negotiation, arbitration and a clear decision-making process for the common framework. You know, is, is it, do all four parties have to agree? What happens if all four don't agree? Do you have qualified majority voting in some sort, how, how on earth does that work when you've got such a disparity between the, the size of the different units and so on? I'm afraid it is all tied together with the, the nature of the framework. Is, it, is the framework one of recommendations that operate at a political level or are you actually creating formal legal obligations, formal legal rules which each administration has to comply with? Well, indeed, and that's essentially what my question was about. In, supplementing uh, Claudia Beamish's question, it's when we have agreed frameworks and then there's a breach of an agreed framework, who then adjudicates over that? And given that the Supreme Court, you've already said, you don't think would be the appropriate place for that to happen, would you be essentially talking about establishing a new court to deal with the post-Brexit Britain and, and the complications that might flow from that. And where would that sit? Presumably that would sit at a UK level if need be to adjudicate between devolved administrations. I think it depends what sort of disputes we're talking about. If the common framework takes the form of very detailed legal-like rules then a court can deal with it. If, the com if what you're talking about, the disagreement, is that the various administrations simply can't agree with it, or there's a broad statement of policy and three of the administrations think that the other one is going off, off the rails, that sort of dispute's definitely not for a court. The more formal, the more precise, the closer it comes to court. And when you're talking about administrations disagreeing between themselves, the chances of there being a superior body to adjudicate seems unlikely. Well, 
I, I would add because of the present constitutional arrangements and the legislation that goes with it. In other systems, federal states or regional states, there are specific constitutional arrangements that are enshrined in constitutional laws that can be enforced because they are enforceable by courts. Uh, so if there is a dispute between administrations, there is a tribunal where these administrative disputes are taken. Clearly, you are not in this position presently in the UK. Therefore, it's hard to configure this scenario. But in the future, with the necessary political will, you could establish these laws and these courts that do provide this kind of adjudication, if you want to. Uh, with, with one or two notable exceptions in this committee, we are lay people. Uh, we can see the problems. Uh, we're all along in defining the problems, but it's solutions that we're looking for from you, the constitutional law experts. So solutions would be gratefully received. If you're imagining a situation where there are disputes, as Professor Reid has said, if you have disputes which really crystallise around legal rules and legal issues, then, in my view, a, a body like the Supreme Court ultimately would be... Um, the appropriate and effective uh, decision taker. If you're talking about essentially political disputes between administrations, then I don't think uh, a court would be the appropriate place um, to, to try and resolve those. Uh, the way to resolve it would be through uh, a pre-agreed uh, voting system, essentially. And uh, clearly, you know, that does raise particular difficulties in the context of um, common frameworks because uh, England, uh, in terms of population, uh, dominates uh, the, the UK. Um, but um, that said, it should not be impossible to develop systems of weighted voting, which uh, acknowledge uh, England's position, but also uh, the, the, the position of the different devolved administrations. And there may also be uh, scope in some areas, and this is why I think it is important for the system to work, that there needs to be a governing statute establishing these sort of parameters in general terms. There may be some areas where it's agreed, for example, that if something is to happen, there needs to be unanimous agreement. So, but these are all political issues that are for politicians to try and grapple with. And to go back to this point, um, the importance of developing a statutory basis um, is exactly that of providing a clear legal basis for the exercise of power so everybody knows who's doing what. And if there is a dispute over who is doing what, then there is a clear statutory basis to look at. And this goes back to the point I made previously. In my own state of Italy, there is constitutional arrangements, specific laws that provide what the regions do, what the central Italian state does, and if there is a dispute, this issue can actually be brought before administrative courts. Mm, uh, and it goes both ways. The central administration can say Lombardy has acted beyond its constitutional powers and so on. But clearly, you don't have this mechanism in the UK presently as a matter of course. This is what I was pointing to. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the final point, I think, is to Mark Roscoe's. Um, just going back to trade again, I just wondered where you saw the potential for investor state dispute mechanisms sitting alongside uh, the court arrangements that we might end up with in, in the UK. How would that interface with a replacement for the ECJ or, or, the, or the Supreme Court? I think that raises a whole separate issue about the desirability and the role of, in, uh, of investor and ar arbitration and so on. That what you're talking about there is a very different legal relationship between the, 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 the two states from the European Union set up, which you've got a much more collective decision-making and general rules being made. If you're talking about just the, the terms of a, a, a one-off treaty between the two parties and the role possibly of individual investors to assert things, you're coming back to the, the wider issue about where does control lie? How, how, is, how far are international agreements going to override the devolution arrangements? And so on. So, I mean, it's not, a, I'm afraid it's another area that's not an, one for an easy answer, an easy solution. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much for.
your time this morning. That's been very useful. Um, I'm going uh, 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 well, to say certainly in preparing my evidence, I was very conscious that I wasn't providing solutions. You know, we're all, I think we're all, we're all struggling that there are some fundamental, big political constitutional decisions to be taken. We can work out the consequences of those, but whether frameworks, agreements, their constitutional arrangements between the different parts of the country, how they're going to work, there are certain big issues about that. Is it going to be political? Is it going to be legal? What are the arrangements going to be? And those are not matters that technicians or lawyers can answer. They've got to be resolved at the, at the higher level. And yes, you can do a lot of pragmatic, low-level stuff in the time being, but at some stage, those big questions are going to have to be faced. Uh, that said, if anything comes to mind after you leave here, <laughs> feel free to write to us. Uh, as I say, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to suspend briefly uh, for five minutes to allow the panels to change. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back uh, to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform uh, Committee. Uh, we will now take evidence from a panel of stakeholders on the environment implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU. I'd like to welcome uh, Johnny Hall from the NFUS, Isabel Mercer from the RSPB, Andrew Midgeway from Scottish Land and Estates, Robin Parker from WWF Scotland, and Daphne Vlastari from Scottish Environment Link. Welcome to you all. Um, I'll kick things off. Can I ask you where you understand the UK and Scottish governments to be in developing the common frameworks to cover environmental issues post-Brexit? Uh, what needs to come, what needs to happen over the coming months? And what uh, input, if any, stakeholders like yourselves are having to that process? I'm happy to kick off with that. Um, certainly there was a, a bit of a vacuum, to say the least, for a considerable period of time, but my understanding, speaking to both uh, um, Westminster and to Edinburgh, as it were, um, is that the so-called deep dive has now commenced because there has been agreement on a number of principles that would allow the establishment of co uh, uh, common frameworks um, importantly, amongst those principles would be the, um, the preservation of the internal UK market, uh, the ability for the UK to uh, negotiate future trade deals, uh, the, the UK ensuring the UK's uh, commitments to international obligations, and indeed the management of common resources. Uh, on those principles alone, uh, I understand that now there has been a significant number of meetings of civil servants uh, across the devolves that have started to look at, certainly from our perspective, future agricultural policy, but also an awful lot of the environmental regulation that is currently uh, driven largely by Europe, but is then transposed into UK and Scots law, uh, that is now uh, happening. How long that deep dive will last uh, remains to be seen. I think they'll have to come up for air at least a few times. Um, uh, and where that will then lead in terms of what remains a UK level in terms of commonly agreed framework and what is then allowed to be devolved uh, remains an unknown quantity. Um, but the sooner we get to that point, the better. But certainly from our perspective on all such matters, we see an absolute need, including on all manner of environmental legislation and regulation, uh, the need for commonly agreed frameworks across the UK, but with then Scotland uh, having the ability to then deliver measures uh, that would then enable the delivery of that. Andrew Mitchell. Thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, our understanding is, is very similar to Johnny's in terms of the, the um, the extent to which the negotiations have undertaken I would, I would, in terms of the, the deep dive and the exploration of the issues. The only um, thing I would add to it is that uh, my understanding is that the focus of the content is, of those discussions is on the governance. It's on how might these arrangements or these common frameworks be um, sort of established between the different constituent parts of the UK rather than the content of the framework. So it's, it's thinking about how things work, and if you can sort out how they work, then the other things can be flowed in later. Um, and that's, that seems entirely appropriate. The, the only thing I would note is that the UK government does seem to be further ahead on the content. So what I have in mind is thinking about the future of agriculture and rural development policy. We hear very strong messages from the UK government um, and, and in the, the, the direction of travel that they would like to see policy develop. And at the moment, we are assuming that they, they they mean for England. Um, there's work going on in Scotland in those areas in terms of the, the, the Scottish Government has appointed its advisors, uh, agricultural champions and rural advisors. So that is ongoing, but it, it looks like the UK Government is sort of further ahead. That's a bit of a worry in terms of the ability of the UK Government to kind of corner the conversations that would then subsequently follow. And in terms of, of what opportunity is there for you guys as stakeholders to be engaging in this process at this stage? Is there any? Sorry, I don't want to dominate, but I, so far I think that there has been, there's been more opportunity for engagement than perhaps has appeared to be the case, looking from the outside in. But it, 
it does need to be worked hard at. You have to knock on doors and make yourself uh, almost awkward, if that's the right expression, annoying. Um, so there hasn't been a, 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 a genuine willingness from either the Scottish Government or the UK Government to embrace an awful lot of what I think of stakeholders have got to offer into this process. But by uh, our very presence as organisations, we are here to lobby and try and influence. Um, and that's what I think we are doing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, our inroads being made. Okay. From an environmental perspective, Daphne Bustari. Thank you, convener. Um, I suppose we are aware, similarly, of the deep dives. Um, I don't think we are um, perhaps as close to the content of those. Um, in terms of sort of common frameworks and opportunities for engagement, I think we are a bit struggling, perhaps, because of the nature of the intergovernmental processes that we have in place at the moment. So with respect to the Joint Ministerial Committee, we feel that this could be very much improved in terms of transparency and stakeholder engagement. Um, we were discussing with the previous panel before uh, about the recent statements they've been making about the principles that should guide common frameworks. I think one of the key principles that was missing is actually stakeholder engagement. So how do we initiate this? dialogues about the, about the structures we will need in the future. Um, so that would be something that we would like to see amended, clarified and improved. Okay, thanks. Kate, Kate Forbes, do you want to come in? Actually, just um, going around each of you, what are the particular environmental areas that you are concerned about maintaining a coordinated approach to environmental policy between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and what are the risks if this doesn't happen? Now, I recognise that there could be a list as long as your arm when you're talking about that. But for you uh, personally, what are your main concerns when it comes to the importance of developing a coordinated approach with the rest of the UK, and what are the risks that you would identify? I think it's... It, towards the length of your arm end of things. And why is that? And I think, well, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be part of the common frameworks discussion. I, I don't want to suggest that that means there needs to be lots of common frameworks because as the previous panel said, you can put lots of issues under one heading or you can put have lots of headings and have put just one issue under each heading or, or whatever. But so why, why, also to add two other facts to this as well, um, you've got a very large proportion of um, Scottish environmental law has some sort of basis in the e in EU law. Um, the figure that usually gets put on this is about 80%. Another, another little fact useful to this discussion is the um, of the 111 uh, areas that the UK government identified where there's an intersection between um, uh, EU competence and the devolution settlement, the largest number of those uh, fall in, in the DEFRA responsibility. Obviously, that doesn't map over entirely to your committee's responsibilities. There's things in um, the Bays area and things in the Department for Transport area that you might be interested in that are part of your responsibility sort of things. So that points to what was there being a lot. Now, why is that? It's because a lot of environmental issues are, by their very nature, transboundary issues. They're issues which ignore political boundaries, ignore um, issues, uh, um, boundaries that we, we impose as people. Um, and there's also a lot of things that are common resources that we need to manage jointly. So as I think you could start putting some very basic principles on what areas need to have um, a joint oversight. And they would be things like where there is um, uh, their transboundary issues, where they, they need to be jointly managed. You could, could go on in that way. What's also important to highlight is that you can have different ways of working together. So obviously um, the Joint Ministerial Committee has acknowledged the need to work together um, to manage shared resources, but already we have different ways of working together across the UK. And so I think that's an important element that we should not lose sight of. It's not as if because we were members of the EU, there was no discussion between you know, the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Um, so in our evidence, we actually did put forward a number of examples where there is existing coordination um, working together with um, you know, all the governments of the UK. And this varies from the very technical, so the work of the JNCC in terms of um, identifying you know, uh, different species or sites that ought to be protected, to the political when it comes to the marine environment where all the UK governments came together, had a political statement, and then um, that was reflected in different pieces of legislation in their own um, 
sort of domestic law. So I think that's an important element to take into account as well. And what we probably need to do is sort of deliberate on what kind of mechanisms we would need per policy issue um, or area, which is easier said than done, perhaps. Thanks. Um, our biggest uh, focus has been uh, around the common agricultural policy. And uh, we came out fairly early on after the vote to leave the EU to say that we thought that there was a need for a common framework around food, farming and, and environment. Um, what, I, I recognise that it's not as clear-cut as environmental legislation, that it's a large area that in, includes um, a funding mechanism, and, um, and so it's, it's a, a complicated area and it doesn't necessarily entirely overlap with the committee, although the committee has a definite interest in it. The, um, the reason that we're so focused on it is because the nature of the common agricultural policy as it stands at the moment actually has a huge influence on the management of the land, which has a huge influence on the delivery of a range of things that the Scottish uh, Parliament, that the Scottish Government um, are interested in, specifically around, um, say, climate change, around uh, environmental management and so on. So the money that's paid through the common agricultural policy at the moment is a, is a big lever to help deliver those environmental objectives. Now, the, um, the, so we came out and said that we thought there should be a common framework. And the, the reason, the risks that we thought there were, um, and the reason we took that line was, first of all, it was around the market. So if one, one, part, one constituent part of the UK did something radically different to the other parts, would that create problems internally within the UK? Now, we have to acknowledge that there is already divergence. The Scottish Government is entirely right to, to highlight that. Um, but there's a question mark of how much divergence is acceptable before it becomes a problem, and, and we don't necessarily have a clear view of that. Um, the, the same sort of arguments apply to thinking about trade relationships when we think about negotiating international trade deals. If one part of the UK is doing something entirely uh, different to the rest, does that create a problem? But the third element, and the reason we thought that framework would be required and the risk that's associated with it, was around funding. Um, so the issue at the, at the moment, we get uh, the sort of proportion of uh, funds around 17 percent, but we worried that if we didn't have a framework, the, the funding would be sort of delivered to Scotland through the block grant, and that could potentially uh, um, lead to a reduction in funding that might be available for the land management that we want to see deliver those wider environmental benefits. So we have to acknowledge in all this that there's lots of ifs and buts, because the Scottish Government could decide, even with a lower budget, to apportion more to land management if it chose to do so. But we just took a more cautious view and thought, well, maybe the, the sort, of, uh, sort of pragmatic approach is to go for a framework to try and safeguard all those things. So it was a cautious approach that we took. More broadly than that, you get into things like the Water Framework Directive, the Nitrates Directive, and so on, where um, there, are act there are activities that um, could be done in different ways. Now, sorry, I, sh I should clarify. So the Water Framework Directive is delivered in different ways at the moment. And we, ha we have to acknowledge, again, that there is divergence of implementation of a broad set of policy objectives. But that's, we can live with that. The question then becomes, well, how much divergence is acceptable? And, 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 the, way, and the way that we envisage a common framework is that it kind of pro provides the, the envelope. It provides the outer limits that stop there being too much divergence for it to become a problem. Um, I think another really important point to note that kind of frames the entire conversation about common frameworks is that we mustn't forget um, that about what future regulatory alignment might be necessary based on the future EU-UK um, relationship. So what areas where we need to, de uh, to develop common frameworks um, will be hugely circumscribed by the content of the withdrawal agreement and any future trade deal that might appear. Um, However, I think it's important to build on some of the comments that my colleague Robin made earlier and um, really examine what are the current arrangements we have now and why has um, there been such strong governance by the EU in environmental legislation. Um, and this is because, again, we come back to the um, point of nature itself being inherently transboundary. And um, because of this, it has been recognised that a common coordinated approach is extremely effective to protect, for instance, habitats and species that cross borders across the UK and the other EU countries. 
Um, and again, that minimum environmental standards are needed to prevent unfair regulatory competition and a race to the bottom on environmental standards. Um, this is very important because these reasons will continue to apply to intra-UK cooperation post-Brexit. Um, and, and it is because of these reasons that there will be a continued need in many policy areas um, for con common frameworks. Um, so we haven't come up with necessarily a list of um, the specific priorities where we believe those areas will definitely need to be agreed. However, we do have some areas where there's a clear, clear um, need over others. For instance, species and habitats conservation is one of those areas. Um, so site designation and selection criteria, um, monitoring criteria, uh, protection of transboundary protected areas like the Upper Solway, Firth and Marshes, which crosses the English and Scottish border. These are all um, clear areas where there will be a continued need for cooperation. Um, as my colleague um, next to me um, already touched on water quality, um, that will be another key area. So river um, district catchment management and also um, marine life is a clear example. Things like fish stocks, seabirds, um, whales, porpoises, small cetaceans um, cross huge vast areas and um, there will be a clear continued need for cooperation in these kinds of areas. I want to the whole issue about cooperation common frameworks in a second. But, uh, Johnny Hall. Yeah, just to uh, echo an awful lot of what uh, Andrew Midgley uh, mentioned there, um, our priorities are very much in line with Scottish Government's own priorities in terms of the, the big three of environmental challenges for, in terms of land use and land management are climate change, water quality and biodiversity. Uh, but what, rather than shying away from that uh, and seeking to erode or amend or adjust a whole raft of legislation that comes through the Birds Directive, Habitats Directive, Nitrous Directive, Water Framework Directive, we rather see this as a, a new opportunity to uh, utilise agricultural land management to try and deliver more by way of solution. You mentioned the solutions in the previous panel, uh, rather than uh, uh, trying to undermine or uh, change that sort of legislation, uh, partly because of the internal market issues that Andrew talked about, uh, but equally our ability to trade, our continuing need to trade with the rest of Europe and uh, further afield, will be built on on. I think more than ever before, uh, a, a transparent and clear ability to deliver on environmental requirements as well as things like animal health and welfare issues, which is the point that Isabel made, I think, as well. Um, I think um, the two or three sensitive areas for us at the moment, when you do start to look at uh, how things might work in a UK context, uh, are clearly around things like pesticides, which was mentioned briefly from a question in the previous pa pa panel, that if you started to distort internal UK agricultural trade, uh, and it, in that sense, if you were allowed to use certain plant protection products in one part of the UK, but not in Scotland, for example, uh, that would be a big issue. And then I think there's a very vexed question of, of, of biotechnology and gene editing and things like that, which uh, we can't uh, sort of brush under the carpet. Uh, because clearly there are diverging views across the UK as well. Um, so that, I think, is something that we will all have to wrestle with at some point and have a proper and clear open debate about the pros and cons of that. Um, and there are many on all sides. Uh, the one point I would uh, lead, finish on, rather, is a, is a very small example of how, under the CAP, we have had a diverging approach to things like greening under Pillar 1 of the Common Agricultural Policy uh, whereby, you know, it's, it's very particular, but nitrogen fixing crops is one of the greening components that uh, uh, individual farmers in Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland could, could do. Uh, but the conditions attached in Scotland uh, has meant that actually Scottish farmers have rejected that as an option because of the very uh, stringent requirements placed on the management of those nitrogen fixing crops. And that has led to a, a perverse response instead of us producing more protein crops uh, and so on, uh, we've shied away from that as a consequence because it's no longer uh, a worthwhile activity for uh, farmers in Scotland to do. Uh, therefore, you know, this whole mention of sticks and carrots uh, becomes a really quite an important aspect of all this as well. Okay, thank you. Briefly, Robin Parker. To what I said earlier, and I maybe didn't listen carefully enough to the exact wording of the question, 
But I think it's for all those reasons that Common Framework, that I, I talked about earlier, that Common Framework is very desirable. Um, whether they they can be made to happen or necessary or, or that sort of thing will very much come down to um, how you see the devolution settlement as it currently stands and ha the outcome of the withdrawal bill in terms of the, the maintained framework sort of thing. I think there's one, our starting point for all of this is what, what's best for the environment. I think there is one very good environmental reason why it's very important that what we end up with are shared frameworks that are commonly agreed by the different governments of the, of the UK. And that's because inevitably if governments are signed up to what the content of those frameworks are, they'll be much more invested and bought into delivering those effectively so that the, effect, the, the environmental outcomes will be, be better delivered because there's a, a commitment to effective implementation of what's in the common framework. Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning. Um, I listened intently to what Andrew Isbell and Jonathan were saying, and basically that was along the same question. I'm not going to ask the question that asked the um, academics before, and I, I want to get into the point that each of your organisations has relied, discussed, um, pressured the EU over the last number of years. I'm sure you're all concerned about what's happening in regards to Brexit and comments about farming, comments about land management comments about uh, what's happening in your organisation, Isabel. What are your views, uh, and are you having discussions with your similar uh, organisations in um, England, Ireland, Northern Ireland, sorry, Wales, um, about how many common frameworks covering environmental policy areas may be required? You, uh, Andrew, you mentioned uh, numerous. Uh, Jonathan, you started to go down a long list also, and, and as it will follow. Um, and what work are you now doing to present all your concerns or all the things that you want to see in these common um, frameworks to the Scottish Government? I'm happy to kick off with, on that one. Um, we work very closely with our colleagues in the NFU England and Wales, so the Ulster Farmers Union, and equally with uh, colleagues south of the border in Ireland, uh, the Irish Farmers Association as well, as well as working with uh, farming unions ac across Europe. Uh, we still have a Brussels office, um, so we are still very much take a coordinated approach when we're looking at EU legislation currently, uh, but going forward beyond Brexit, um, we are m very mindful of what sort of regulatory uh, framework and environment, agriculture and food production will find itself in in the future. Um, rather than, as I said earlier, rather than shying away from that and saying, well, we need to, to start to dismantle some of this in any way, I think pretty much uh, the whole cut and paste exercise of the withdrawal bill is the right sort of starting point for us. Um, as I said earlier, uh, well, I may have said I can't remember. Um, the last thing that we want to do as UK agriculture or Scottish agriculture is have that race to the bottom, which Isabel referred to. We want to maintain those environmental standards, arguably elevate them. And not only that, we see the future direction of CAP and CAP type support um, as being driven largely, as Michael Gove said at the Oxford Farming Conference, about public funding for public benefit, public good. Uh, but we don't view that as being a one or the other, that you support agricultural businesses to produce food on the one hand, or you support land management in the round to deliver environmental um, benefits. Those two things, if we're smart about it, can actually be brought together. And I think that's a view very much shared by other farming unions across the United Kingdom. Let's get smarter at how we farm, but at the same time, let's get smarter at how we then also provide for water quality, climate change, biodiversity, and so on. For too long under the CAP, because of the very nature of those two pillars of the CAP, there's been a big gap between the two that said, uh, basically, we'll support farm incomes over here and I'll let farms become a bit more efficient and, uh, and invest and so on. And on the other hand, we'll pay farmers to do agri-environmental management and so on. Really, we need to bring those two things together. So what's good for the bottom line of the agricultural business in terms of things like nutrient use uh, and so on, is also good for water quality and climate change. Driving efficiencies into agriculture is a way forward, rather than worrying about what legislative sticks are required. We need a legislative backstop on a number of fronts without question, and we can arguably raise that up in some situations. But I I'm, I'm don't think we're getting too hung up about that. We're more inclined to think, well, how do we encourage 
better practice, best available technologies and so on, to drive a, a, an industry that is the bedrock of the food and drink sector in Scotland, but it's also responsible for 70% of land use in Scotland. That point, in, in this dialogue with other, <coughs> excuse me, farming unions, is there a, a respect from them for the fact that 17% of the funding should continue to come to Scottish agriculture? And is there a respect for the fact that Scottish agriculture is unique in its nature with West Faber areas? I, I think the, uh, on the second one, uh, there is a complete understanding across other parts of the UK that Scotland is significantly different from the rest of uh, uh, the UK. Uh, and we've always said that any agricultural policy going forward that works particularly well for Cambridgeshire is a disaster for Scotland. And if that's a one-size-fits-all across the UK, defra-centric is the expression I keep using, well, that's unacceptable. Uh, but we do get support and recognition for that. Where there's none of our union uh, colleagues uh, across the UK saying, no, we need, a, we need a common approach to the delivery of agricultural policy and schemes and mechanisms, so on. Quite the reverse. And I think Michael Gove's now saying that, uh, and we're getting those signals out of DEFRA all the time. On your, on your uh, very um, political point, I might add, of convergence funding and so on, um, without question, uh, there is a disagreement between ourselves and the other farming unions on this, because clearly, even if the Treasury continued to fund agriculture in the UK and rural development in the UK to the same extent as we currently enjoy from the CAP, and if there was any move towards Scotland gaining any greater share than it currently does, then that means somebody else loses out. Uh, and I, I venture to say that our colleagues in Northern Ireland are particularly vocifer vociferous about this because they would be the fundamental area to lose out. Having said that, M Michael Gove has committed to Fergus Ewing that there will be a full review of the whole convergence issue and the allocation of funding across the United Kingdom. Whilst we're less inclined to be worried about what's happening in the immediate past and now, we think that's critical in terms of setting a baseline for funding allocations from whether it be 2019, 2021, or whenever onwards. So that is a vitally important piece of work. But as Andrew pointed out, any sort of barnetized approach would be disastrous as well. So I think we need to tread carefully in that review process, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's very much welcome. Robin Parker. Yeah, so going back to Mr Lyle's question, in terms of how we work with our colleagues across other parts of the, the UK, um, the, on Brexit the answer is a lot, like there's, there's any number of telephone calls and coordination meetings and following what they're up to in, in Westminster and the like um, going on and we have, we've come to very sort of identified similar major concerns, similar priorities for, for issues in, in, in the, the first place um, in, in terms of what are the things that, are, the environmental things that are threatened by Brexit, I think those things are, are quite the same anywhere in the, the UK, the kind of basic principles. We, we do have to do a lot of work to, um, I may say, to uh, remind our colleagues in London um, that the way the devolution settlement works in the UK and remind them that, you know, there is a great deal of things that are relevant to Brexit that are devolved to the Scottish Parliament and so on. And uh, I think anyone who's worked with, with anyone in, in England, there isn't a good understanding of, of devolution there. And so I think we've all got a job to do in terms of explaining that and kind of hammering home that message message constantly. Um, the other thing I was going to say was, um, I think this goes back also to the first question about where we are and the difficulty and the challenge I think we face with working with our UK colleagues is that there isn't a clear process um, for developing common frameworks, for deciding if common frameworks are needed and where for us to feed into. So if you draw the, the contrast with how WWF is maybe a good way of thinking about it, where WWF is an organisation that exists in many European countries. So where there's a common framework getting developed for the whole of the EU, there's a very clear transparent process and we know what the next steps and what the next phases are. So organisations like us, and we can tell members of the public, when, when is the key moment to lobby your national government? When's the key moment to lobby the European Parliament? When's the key moment that my counterpart lobbyists in Brussels need to be in hammering on the door of the commissioner? And we don't have any equivalent to that in the current situation. There isn't a process going forward. So we can have nice meetings. Our, my colleagues will get called and have a nice meeting with DEFRA, state out all their concerns. 
we can have a nice meeting with Scottish Government to state what our priorities are and that sort of thing. But it's very hard for us to see how those things are then going to get developed into a common framework. And perhaps most importantly, when conflicts inevitably arise, and that's, that's the challenge, that it, it worked well. And there's, there's examples from the past that when things have worked well. A, a really good example that I may refer to again in evidence is, is the development of a marine policy statement um, for the whole of the UK, where the, all ministers came together, agreed a common approach to marine planning. You then had separate marine acts take place in, in different parts of the UK. But the challenge will be on, on topics where there's disagreement and how, how do those things get resolved? How, how can we as stakeholders influence those processes? How can you as parliamentarians and your counterparts scrutinise those processes? There aren't answers to that at the moment. Yeah, just to build on some of those points. Um, so you asked about working with UK colleagues and whether we had a list of kind of areas and a number of areas where we think there will be need, needed to be common frameworks developed. We don't have a definitive list. Um, I do work very closely. We work very closely with um, colleagues in all the UK countries. Um, again, to kind of identify common areas of concern about the implications of Brexit and um, about discussions we've had with our respective governments. Um, what we've focused on, because there are so many uncertainties, as I mentioned earlier, about where uh, political and legal uncertainties about where we might need to develop common frameworks, um, we've instead focused on a list of principles that we think could guide the development of those frameworks, and that's something we've been working on doing collabor collaboratively across um, our UK organisations. Um, so, for instance, um, something we were pleased to see in the JMC communique was this issue of flexibility. So, a policy framework, yes, to guide, but allowing flexibility to tailor uh, individual implementation legislation and policy to the context, be that political, environmental, cultural, um, to each country within the UK is, we believe, really key. Um, as Robin mentioned earlier, we think that these common frameworks should be jointly developed and agreed by all four um, nations and subject to sufficient scrutiny by the relevant legislators when appropriate. And um, as Daphne mentioned, be subject to appropriate stakeholder consultation. These are all things that we think are really key to ensuring that common frameworks will have the best outcome for um, environmental protections. Um, and finally, another one would be um, creating shared governance arrangements to ensure that any um, governance gaps that might emerge as a result of losing the oversight and accountability of some EU institutions, such as the Court of Justice or the, EC, uh, the European Commission, are um, jointly ta uh, tackled um, effectively between all four governments. Thank you. Let, let's explore the principles for the common frameworks. Mark Ruskell. Yes, I think Isabel's already um, touched on some of those, but I wonder if we could get views from, from across the panel um, you know, Isabel had mentioned the, the JMC communique. What, what's your views on, on that communique? Are, are there gaps in there? Are there uh, areas which, uh, which concern you? And, and if you could just uh, um, explain what those are. So. Yeah, so I think, as I mentioned before, um, there's a couple of things that we've already touched upon. One is the fact that there is no reference to stakeholder engagement. Uh, and this is quite critical. This is a, a you know, we haven't done any such exercise in the past uh, in the UK or in Scotland, so we need to um, make sure that we take views into account uh, in a thorough, consistent and transparent manner. Unfortunately, the JMC process, which seems to be the main vehicle through which these discussions are happening on an intergovernmental basis, uh, lacks the necessary transparency. It doesn't, as far as we understand, involve any sort of parliamentary oversight or scrutiny. Uh, and as such, engaging is not very easy. It's not very easy to engage when you don't know when the meetings are happening or you don't know uh, what the meetings are going to be about. So essentially, we find ourselves in sort of the receiving end once there is a decision that is being made. Um, and therefore, we sort of play a catch-up game, which is not ideal. What are the as well? Well, I, I think, well, as you may know, for example, that there has been, there's consideration of a complaint of, to the Aarhus Committee um, for the withdrawal bill because it's considered that it potentially is amending environmental legislation. Mm -hmm. And as such, public engagement should have um, been taken into account, which of course didn't happen. Uh, of course, this is an ongoing process. But I think if we believe in good governance, you need to have a proper um, sort of public engagement process in place. Um, the other aspect that we wanted to raise is that there is um, sort of 
it's very great that there is recognition from all sides that we need to commonly want to manage um, jointly common resources. But I think that shouldn't um, sort of restrict us so much in that um, the any UK frameworks or common frameworks also with the Republic of Ireland foreseeably should set some minimum targets that we want everybody to be compliant with. But that should allow the different administrations to go above and beyond those. And this is something that is currently possible under the EU framework. So as long as any Scottish government initiative doesn't go against EU rules, you know, you're more than welcome to go ahead with that. And that is a provision we would want to maintain in addition to the relevant flexibility um, for the, the types of frameworks that we'll be looking at. Anyone else? Mark Russell. Okay, um, I'd like to just go back to the issue of, of trade um, again, uh, which is covered in, in the JMC uh, communique. And I think as Professor Little said in, in the last session, there is a question there about to what extent environmental uh, legislation intersects uh, with uh, trade negotiations and, and discussions. So can I perhaps start the panel by asking you, to what extent do you believe that environmental and animal health and welfare regulations will be on the table when it comes to trade deals or whether it will be off the table? We'll start with Johnny, perhaps. It, no, it's a very difficult one to, to, to predict, but in our opinion, it needs to be absolutely on the table as part of the trade negotiations, because uh, as, a, as an agricultural economy in particular and our food and drink sector, uh, the whole issue of provenance, and an awful lot of that is driven by our environmental standards and our environmental management, as well as the animal health and welfare issues, is, is becomes almost our unique selling point. Um, we're not going to be operating, I don't think, or able to operate in, in any sort of market for agricultural and food products where it's a, a, about stacking it high, selling it low. Uh, that's not where we want to be. We want to retain uh, our standards. We want to be able to arguably in, improve on those standards so that they're very clear to the, ultimately to the consumer. And, and what is the story behind the products that we grow and rear within Scotland. Um, from the outset, we've had major concerns that any open free trade agreement that is about sucking in effectively cheap imports of food from other parts of the world which do not operate at the same environmental standards as we currently do um, is that so-called race to the bottom, and that's not where we want to be. So whilst you might import port food, you're exporting your own responsibility for environmental management. It's quite simple. Uh, and that's not a place that certainly Scottish agriculture wants to be. So I think the point you make, uh, and I think the point that was made by the previous panel is absolutely right, that environmental um, issues have to be embedded into trade negotiations. It can't just be about pound shillings and pence and trade flows and balance of payments and so on. It's about the, the non-financials behind some of those uh, issues as well. It's about the standards to which we produce um, and the reputation of what we produce. So it's just to be clear, you believe that it should be part of the negotiation, but we should have a negotiating stance which leads to increasing and, and better quality. Yes. Uh, or do you believe it should be off the table? Just No, I think be it should part, be on the table. It should be on part, the table. Part of that negotiation uh, built around the fact that if we are producing and operating to high animal health and welfare standards and environmental standards, and that when we go into any trade negotiation, that should be as much a part of the negotiation as looking at the trade flows uh, and the balance sheet of those trade flows in terms of financials. It's, it's as important if we are to retain and preserve, arguably, certainly Scottish agriculture's USP, is, uh, is that we are not a stack it high, sell it low agricultural okay. economy that's all around driving down costs mm -hmm. regardless of the impacts on the environment. Uh, and in terms of the CETA um, EU trade deal and the current trade deals that are being worked up, a gala with Israel and Korea, how involved has the NFUS been in that? Uh, negligible. Negligible, right. Okay. In terms of actually having an influence on that process. Right. We are endeavouring to make as many inroads as we can to the, certainly the, the Liam Foxes of the world and some of the statements he's come out with in recent times. 
uh, we, you know, we, we want clarity and certainty on, on what the UK government's position is on some of these issues. Okay. Um, just through the chair, can I just take views from the rest of the panel as well about whether you see environmental regulations as being tradable? Are they, are they in this deal? Are they, are, they, are they wrapped up with deals that are coming forward or, or not? environmental NGO point of view, I would say that we don't want our environmental protections, animal welfare protections, to be compromised by any uh, new trade deals. We feel that um, if there is going to be a very uh, sort of close trading relationship with the EU, I don't, I don't think it would be, um, uh, we should be considering the fact that you will want guarantees about those same issues, environmental protections, animal health. So that will probably limit a bit the extent to which there could be a potential for, you know, completely, complete deregulation. Um, the other aspect to take into account is, of course, that there has been a trade bill laid in Westminster. Um, as far as we're understanding at the moment, we have not confirmed whether or not that will require any sort of LCM. The assumption is no, because it's considered a reserved issue. But there is a concern uh, among the wider environmental and geo community about the amount of SIs that this bill includes as well, and the relative freedom that it allows ministers without any parliamentary scrutiny to continue with trade deals or reenact existing ones post-Brexit. Um, the other aspect that I would like to highlight, and like, we're not trade experts, but we're delving into the issue, is that um, what are the constitutional capacity at the moment of devolved governments to be involved in this issue, and what will be the um, procedural, the process through which they would be engaged? Again, we come back to the issue of the intergovernmental relations and the mechanisms set up to address those. Now, the Welsh government has come up with some ideas about how devolved uh, administrations, parliaments and governments could be involved in issues that are in principle reserved but impact on devolved issues. And I think those would merit some consideration. Um, mm -hmm. The other aspect that I would like to highlight is we've, I've talked a lot about the JMC process. I just want to highlight that um, the limitations of that process have been highlighted in different committees, not only in the Scottish Parliament but also in Westminster. So this is a key sort of institutional issue that we need to address to have the best frameworks in place for the future. Just to add very shortly a couple of things. Um, the first thing to add, um, just to provide another example, um, fisheries is another very obvious example where just in, well, both both the, from our point of view, in, in environmental considerations should absolutely be part of the discussion. Um, there is absolutely a threat that environmental issues could be in theoretically traded away um, and the desire, um, very similar to, to what um, Andrew Hall said, uh, we'd want to see that you know the, the where Scottish seafood can be on the international markets is a very high sustainability product, and that's that that will be the selling point. So the the direction would have to be to push up environmental standards um, here in Scotland, here in the UK, as part of a, a seafood um, trading thing. Uh, also to add, again, you can kind of look at for examples of how environmental issues have been positively pushed as part of um, uh, trade arrangements and so on. Um, an often overlooked part of the common fisheries policy has been about the, 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 the global dimension. And for example, in the EU and particularly in the UK, we eat a huge amount of tuna. So, you know, one, there's been work that's gone on in the EU to push up environmental standards globally around those kind of issues. So how do those, those things uh, continue? Um, uh, and then I think the other thing I'll just come to is that it's kind of hard, it's also hard to see how environmental issues won't be part of the, the, the trade uh, debate. Um, it's very hard to see. Uh, I think also the, the, the difficult question to think about is where's the intersection between trade and devolution going to be? So what, what's the role of this place? Um, and for example, even if you're in the kind of um, the Canada style trade agreement, it, you, you know, the examples you've already referred to, you would definitely want that if you're the Canadians, you want a reassurance that any environmental standards that get agreed to as part of that trade agreement and trade, the trade agreement as things currently stand would be getting made by the UK government. You'd want assurances that, that it would be delivered, those environmental commitments would be delivered on both in England by the UK government, but also in Scotland by the, the, the Scottish government. So it, it creates fundamental questions for the nature of, of the UK. And just my, to, my understanding of the trade bill that, that Daphne highlighted is that it will require a legislative consent motion and that it, um, 
that the current thinking of Scottish Government is not, not to grant that. And I think to some extent for the same reasons uh, as with the withdrawal bill. So I think it, the trade bill is something that does require, you know, will require this place to think about and does require more thought um, from committees and so on in the Parliament. In the Parliament, uh, Finlay Carson's got a couple of years he wants to explore. Thanks, Convener. I should declare an interest as I've been a member of the, the NFU. <clears throat> um, and Johnny, the NFU uh, submitted that uh, they, they thought that a strengthened uh, GMC or an emulated Council of Ministers uh, could uh, provide better uh, dispute resolution and so on. With that in mind, uh, does that suggest that, uh, that Scottish interests are best served um, through the, the GMC um, or do you have other suggestions how the Scottish interest could be best represented? Well, string into some uh, <coughs> sensitive areas there a wee bit. Um, As, as things currently stand, I, I, I suspect the, the, the GMC approach is, is what's, on the, the, what's available. And without anything suddenly lurching away from that, I, I can't see any change from that being the case for the foreseeable future. So I think it's about working with what we've got. Uh, certainly that's, that would be our approach in, in, in any of this. Um, none of us know how this will pan out in the longer term. Um, but they're the, the existing structures uh, that we, we all have to work with. Um, I, I certainly see um, going forward the need for, uh, as we are going through the transition beyond 2019 to 2021, or where, whatever that might be and, and beyond, that there will be a need, I think, for some sort of, as was discussed in the, in the first panel, uh, a need for some sort of constitutional governance body to oversee issues that uh, of divergence or disagreement across the UK, which is separate maybe from the political process. Now, I'm not enough of an expert on those things, but clearly as we currently operate under, this, under, the, under the CAP within Europe, we have a European Commission, we have a European uh, justice system, we have several degrees of audit, uh, too many, I think, but they are sort of independent from the political process in many senses. So there's a degree of ensuring that member states uh, abide by their obligations but, and also implement and spend taxpayer funding in the right way and there's an audit trail and so on. So there is a question as to how we operate future agricultural policies, future environmental requirements uh, and making sure that there's a consistent approach across the UK. And I wouldn't see any problem with that at all. I think it's an absolute necessity if only for transparency and certainty for the taxpayer interest as much as anything else, um, or society's interest as a whole. How that is constituted is way beyond my, my pay grade, I'm afraid. Through the chair, can I just ask the same question to the, the rest of the panel, but also can I ask you to reflect on, uh, on your answer on how the, the Scottish Parliament would play a role in, in the scrutiny thereafter? How do you foresee the, the Scottish Parliament being involved? Um, I, I, would, I would support um, what Johnny ended in saying there in, the, in that I suspect that there is a need for a new entity, a body, or um, it's more than a committee. Um, because if we think, think, so if I start from my core interest at the moment around the common agricultural policy, what works at the moment? You have the European Commission, which effectively sets out through the, the other wider processes in the um, in, in Brussels, you've got the the Commission sort of allocating funding. Well, with the the Council Minister and so on, there's the allocation of funding. There's the establishment of the structures through which any framework works. So, under the Common Agricultural Policy, you've got the establishment of direct payments regulation. You've got <coughs> rural development regulation. So, under one, something has to be done broadly in line in every member state, and in others, there's a greater degree of implementation where you can design your own rural development programs or down at the region level. Um, and then it's policed, so if you don't do what you are meant to do, then the commission can come in and look at the degree to which you are adhering to the things that you said you would do. Now, um, under the JMC, the JMC can go so far down that route in setting out a broad sort of uh, direction of travel and agreement among the member states, but you immediately get into issues um, 
in terms of um, so the the weighting that's given to the voices in determining the way forward. You get into questions around um, policing. Who does that? It can't be a committee in that way. Does DEFRA do that? If DEFRA does that, then that would seem to be a big, bigger problem because they're also representing England. So there's a, a set of issues there. So that leads you down the route of a new entity which is created for the purpose of overseeing the creation and the management of different frameworks. Now, this links with all the other questions about how many and, um, and how they might work, because there's a practical, pragmatic element that we need to take into account. We can't create so many of these things that they each all need their own institution. Um, so it has to be something that's doable. Um, there, there may be things that can be doable within the member states that don't need to be sort of given to that body. Um, but all that, I think, has to be worked out, and we, and we haven't created a, a very clear model um, yet, but we, I think we are in the realms of a separate, a separate body. So, so I think if I understand correctly your question, you're alluding really to the governance gaps that we have identified. So some of the, the functions that we would be losing um, from withdrawing from the EU would be, of course, the particularly some of the, the functions of monitoring reporting carried out by different EU agencies, um, the role of the Commission in kind of coming in if there's a complaint that a member state or other actor is not uh, implementing the legislation correctly, EU legislation correctly, and then at the end of that spectrum, intervention by the ECJ. So these are a number of functions that we call at least among the environmental NGOs kind of the governance gaps that are emanating. Um, the solution to those um, partly depends on what will be the um, final deal with the EU. There is discussion at the moment ongoing with the Commission and the European Parliament, and some are hinting at the fact that the EU may require the UK as a whole to comply with a number of environmental pieces of legislation as part of the deal. And we know already from the very beginnings that the EU would require some sort of mechanism to verify that the UK is living up to its own end of the deal. That's the one thing. The second thing for me is the extent um, and development of the common frameworks. So if these are jointly agreed respecting the devolution um, settlement, as we would argue uh, should be the case, um, you would expect um, an, perhaps a number of bodies in the different countries that could deal with those issues or a sort of joint body that looks at it from a UK for country point of view. And there's different models um, that you could um, sort of envisage. First thing would be that some of the functions currently carried out by um, EU bodies, such as the monitoring reporting, could be e easily done by agencies such as um, you know, SEPA or SNH or equivalent JNCC across the UK. I think the, the most salient point here is how do we replicate the roles of the Commission and the ECJ, because that's the main bit, that supranational bit that holds everyone equally into account. That's the bit that we would be missing out on. And so this is why there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not having one UK-wide, but truly UK-wide body would make most sense so that, let's say, we are in the position where Scottish Government um, has been very active on a specific issue like waste management, gone you know, way beyond, but for some reason all their parts of the UK are lagging behind and not respecting these established frameworks, then that mechanism would allow the Scottish Government to challenge other governments and say, well, you're not playing according to the established rules, you need to elevate your ambition. Uh, so that would be one a very um, great asset of the supranational element that we are going to be missing out from the we could replicate it in that in that sense um, and we could do that in in different ways I think before we mentioned environmental courts you could have environmental courts set up in Scotland where let's say a UK-wide ombudsman or other commissioner or regulator could refer cases. And you could foreseeably have these um, positions also refer to the Scottish Parliament depending on the issue or the approach to be that needs to be taken. Um, I think what we need to be doing at the moment is examining the potential for different solutions. And I think the Scottish Government is looking into doing that. It has set up different subgroups that are looking into that and deliberations are ongoing with a view to producing, I think, some report towards the middle of March. 
Um, I think it's equally important to take into account what's happening sort of at the UK level with the Secretary of State um, having committed to also address the governance gap. And I think it will be quite important that if we um, jointly feel that um, a UK joint supranational type of body is the preferable option for and better environmental outcomes, it would be important that any process that is taken by any of the governments um, fully involves the others as equal partners, rather than seeking to sort of add them at the end of the process, you know, uh, you know, and you can tag along if you want, but it has to be jointly developed. Thank you, convener. I, I didn't ask, answer the second part of your question, which is about scrutiny, and it, it's potentially a really big issue if you create a separate body um, that operates at a sort of a, a level that's above the sort of devolved power, but not or sort of a UK level, but not necessarily at um, UK government level. You create this potential sort of vacuum of scrutiny, and I, it, the, the things that come to mind is the it would come down to how the powers were to, the, um, that were used to create the body and the establishment in that process of legislation, presumably with legislative consent, so UK legislation with legislative consent, um, to enable the Scottish Parliament to scrutinise that body and establish, establish that right at the very beginning so that we don't allow that vacuum, so that this committee can then do its job. Isabel Marshall. Um, yeah, so I think we've kind of established that there's two different issues um, being discussed here. One of them is the need for new and improved intergovernmental working arrangements to develop those common frameworks and agree them. And that's where we would um, definitely call for a new and improved version of the JMC or some sort of Council of Ministers um, with increased stakeholder consultation, scrutiny and transparency. I think there's a clear need for that, as everyone's agreed. Um, on the point of new governance arrangements to tackle post-Brexit governance gaps, as my colleague Daphne has kind of already discussed in some detail, I think it's quite important to reiterate that th this governance um, gap is very much a spectrum with monitoring and reporting a kind of a softer end and enforcement and compliance um, and ensuring implementation at the other. And because of that kind of complicated nature of the spectrum, it's very unlikely that one solution would tackle all of the aspects of the governance gap. Um, this means that even if, to say, uh, some sort of UK-wide regulatory environmental body was created, it's unlikely that that would be sufficient um, to tackle the governance gap as a whole. And it's highly likely that in addition to that UK body, if it were created, um, there would also need to be country-specific solutions in Scotland and the other countries, such as perhaps an environmental court specific to Scotland or an environment commissioner specific to Scotland, as kind of Daphne's already um, discussed. Um, I think from an environmental perspective purely, there would be some advantages to a UK-wide body, so particularly looking at pooling of resources and expertise. Um, the environment is an area where um, data um, collation and, and management is extremely important and can be extremely costly. Monitoring and reporting can be extremely costly, particularly, for instance, in the marine environment. So there could be some advantages to pooling um, the expertise in those um, areas. Do you think if we got this right, there is a potential to reduce the uh, instances of the likes of NGOs going to judicial review in these areas? Not that you would necessarily remove that option, but do you think it could, if, it was, if we got this pinned down, it could have that advantage, both for the NGO and for, and for the process of government? Yeah, I think something we think would definitely be key to any kind of new body that was created, um, whether this is the, the overall UK body or individual solutions within each country, a key, a key part of that should be an, a mechanism to ensure accessible, um, uh, to ensure that civil society can, can take um, complaints or issues to, to that body, for instance, if they believe there's been a breach of any Environment Act in that country, and I believe that mechanism could... Um, could, yes, uh, potentially. The digital review process can be expensive and very time-consuming. Exactly. So yeah. this would get around the issue of um, the Aarhus Convention implementation in Scotland and ensure that um, there is a mechanism that is accessible to all and that isn't prohibitively expensive. Yeah, OK, thanks. Robin Parker. Sorry, can, you, you, can, I, can I just add sorry. one thing there? Just, just thinking out loud in, in, a, in a way. In many senses, land managers in particular uh, are in a, in a transaction 
process with the taxpayer, that, uh, which is, is relatively easy to audit in the fact that farmers, crofters and others get paid for certain land management, and, and it's about the inputs and the outputs to that. Uh, where we've always struggled is about the outcomes that are associated with those actions. And the difference between outputs and outcomes, I think, is going to be critical because w what is it if we spend X amount on agri-environment schemes in terms of trying to improve our biodiversity, we might measure financially how much we've spent and how many hectares have been in involved in some agreements or whatever. But we're very, very poor at actually saying, well, we've delivered X or Y or Z for the environment in terms of biodiversity, water quality and so on. And I think that that's, remains a real challenge area, but it's arguably an opportunity here. Um, you think of uh, special protection areas and SACs under the Birds Directive, Habitats Directive, uh, the status of our waters under the Water, water Framework Directive, and SNH and SEPA have, have a clear role to play. But even they can't then... I, you know, have, where, where, where is their governance to say, well, yes, we've, we've met a certain standard. We know we've still got challenges on a, a lot of our designated sites for reaching favourable status and so on, or favourable condition, whatever the right expression is. Um, so we've, we'll always be pretty good at doing the obvious accounting. But I think the real challenge for arguably uh, all the institutions in Scotland is to develop processes that actually say, well, have we delivered what we set out to achieve? Which is a different question. Okay, thank you for that. Robin Parr. I offer three points building on other, other things. The first one on your question, Kavina, about um, JR. And um, I think you can, again, you can learn a little bit from the exact, we're kind of, in a way, trying to replicate some of the roles of the commission. And you've seen in what the commission has done, often just the commission starting that process has been enough to kind of kick folk up the bum and that the example of clean air for example um, it started without it having to go to the whole legal process even though that is something the commission's been able is able to do um, I appreciate Isabel's tidying of the conversation so the first question here is really about um, what do we do in the we're developing a common framework there's a dispute what do we do sort of thing um, obviously I think in that process some sort of way of greasing the wheels of toward agreement would be beneficial because we do feel that in many cases if something can be agreed that's going to be beneficial for the environment but the obvious thing that happens if there is no if there is a dispute is that you fall back on the, the devolution settlement and where whoever's got the powers to do that thing that's where things get get implemented but I think generally we feel that's not that's not in many areas where it's a it's a common issue an environmental issue that's not the ideal thing and then the last point, I think on, um, I think Daphne set out the case very strongly for why um, there is potentially a need for a common governance body to kind of fill this governance gap that, that we've highlighted. Um, and as Isabel said, you know, maybe in some areas, maybe in not other areas, maybe more than one solution, that sort of thing. I think that going back to Finley Carson's point, there's potentially a really important role for the parliaments, plural, in, in that, in that if, um, in who, who owns what that if that those governance body or that governance body who does that who's responsible for that who does who's that a child of sort of thing if that becomes a child of one government sort of thing then that doesn't level the playing field that inevitably is there's a risk that it comes in thrall to that government so i think there's um the better option is that it belongs to the parliaments and that's um going to end in better governance solutions but that's a really challenging point to get to. Um, I think you have to do have to give some credit on this issue to Michael Gove. He's responded very quickly to our concern that we've we've raised that there is a governance gap here. But what that is in danger of starting a, a process of is they're going to move to consultation quite quickly. And so the question, I think, back in, into your court, if you share our concern and share our conclusion that a governance solution is is beneficial, there's very little precedent. So you're going to have to work quite hard to work with other parts other parliaments of the uk to create a different governance solution that that is created in a different way and you, just to think again of where examples can be learned from the only example we really have of a, a kind of parliamentary type commissioner role um is in things like the uh, the children's commissioner model but that's where that's their commissioners that belong only to, to one parliament they're not shared across the parliaments okay thank you for that um
Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, convener. Can I refer to my uh, register of interest as a landowner and a farmer and as, a, as a member of um, SLE? Um, I've got one specific question, one general question. The specific question is to Johnny Hall, and it ref it's on the back of something that um, Andrew Midgley said in, in respect of future agricultural support, um, where it was suggested by Mr Midgley that the um, UK government is cornering the market, uh, and you yourself have referred to Michael Gove's um, Oxford speech. Um, do you believe that the Scottish Government is behind the curve in setting out its, its views on agricultural support, say, post-2022? I, I think it is. Um, I think it... Uh, but arguably for understandable reasons. Um, I, th I think um, I would agree with Andrew entirely that uh, DEFRA are setting the running, but then they're in a position, they've been in the driving seat as UK Government ministers, if you like, to, to, to do that. Um, it's allowed certainly DEFRA thinking to uh, be initiated and to start to creep out, uh, which we haven't seen particularly from the Scottish Government in terms of, uh, yes, there's been the Agricultural Champions and the National Council of Rural Advisors and, and so on, uh, but that's been very high-level, high-principled um, notions of where does Scottish agriculture want to be in the future, what does it need to deliver beyond the food production alone and so on. Um, we are lagging behind in terms of, well, what is it in terms of specific measures and mechanisms that might actually get us to whatever that vision might be, and that's the level at which DEFRA aren't uh, concluding yet, but at least they've started that sort of phase of work. They are looking at uh, various options uh, relating to uh, how funding can be better allocated to active land managers and farmers, uh, looking more at productivity and innovation measures at the same time as tackling some big environmental challenges as well. Uh, they are looking at the whole notion of, of limiting support payments to agricultural businesses in different ways and how you might recycle that funding and so on. This is, I think, quite constructive thinking. It's, a, it's really preparing for a new approach beyond the life of the CAP as it were, or beyond our time with the CAP. Uh, and that chimes more closely with our thinking and what we've been saying about this than some of the, uh, the, the, the messages that have come out of Scottish Government. I think Scottish Government's themes and principles are right, but they haven't backed them yet in thinking, well, how do we actually start to achieve some of those things? So there's been a, a lot of about vision and longer term of objectives uh, and so on but it hasn't translated yet into thinking, well, if we're starting at point A in 2018 or 2017, um, then how do we get ourselves to point B by 2021? How do we get ourselves to point C by 2024 and so on? And I think that's the real thinking that has to happen now, otherwise we get left behind. Um, can I move uh, on to um, common frameworks and I appreciate we've covered a lot of ground on this already so and time is short so if, if as briefly as you could please could each of the panel outline their kind of headline challenges that Scotland faces in um, agreeing and implementing common frameworks how would you sum up headlines please <laughs> you flummoxed them <laughs> the, 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 the memorandum of understanding agree that the JMC provides, you know, no one can disagree with what's in it, but it's kind of what happens next. What's the process for happening next? To me, that's the biggest challenge. So it's a moving target. What do we feed into? I would echo those thoughts. I would also perhaps flag that perhaps one of the things we haven't talked about enough today is the role of the Republic of Ireland. Obviously, it's very important for Northern Ireland to have some sort of um, kind of same standards and so on uh, with, you know, as the, the whole island, island of Ireland, which is also important for environmental issues. So I think uh, when we're talking about frameworks, we also need to realise that a lot of those will not necessarily be UK or Great Britain only. It might be UK, it might be uh, all the British Isles. It could even cons concern some Nordic countries if you're talking about marine. So I think we need to incorporate that type of flexibility in our reflections going forward. Um, I uh, would actually pick, on, pick up on something that Robin said. I think we're, we're all kind of moving through this together 
And so seeing a long way ahead and to the big challenges of implementing is, is maybe slightly too far ahead. So what I'm looking at at the moment is from the, uh, the communique that came out from the JMC about the definitions of principles, it, it, it essentially sets out that common frameworks will be established where they are necessary in order to prevent various things. The debate that needs to be had is, well, what counts as necessary? And I don't think we necessarily know where the thresholds are in some of the topics that we're talking about, which would make something, oh, it's okay, we don't need to worry about one in this area, or we're probably likely to go past the threshold and we are going to need one. So what I have in mind is um, if you, we have a divergence of policy in, in farming at the moment, the way it's implemented across the UK, and so we can live with divergence, and we implement farm support in different ways, but where would we diverge to such a great extent that it would become a problem? And I, I don't think we necessarily have clarity on where those thresholds are. The same would apply with environmental issues, is that you know, we do uh, um, um, uh, implement environmental um, legislation differently. If we think about the Water Framework Directive, um, landscape designations come to mind. You know, there are various ways that they're implemented slightly different ways. Um, so divergence isn't itself necessarily a, require, a, a problem that needs to be solved for a framework, but how do we know when we will di diverge too far that it will be re a requirement? And I'm not sure we have done the work to work out where that threshold is. Um, I think kind of building on all the comments that have already been made, we'd probably see one of the biggest stumbling blocks is the um, inadequacies of the current intergovernmental working arrangements. Um, and yeah, the, the need for new, um, more transparent, more consultative arrangements that can actually make binding decisions on this is necessary to move forward. I think that the, the JMC communique from October was very positive in setting some principles. However, we were quite concerned about the second um, communique that came out in December that said that um, common frameworks were going to be agreed in a minority of areas and it did not uh, establish which areas those might be and whether environment would be included in those. I think, Convina, you touched on it in your opening remarks about the, the very different agricultural landscape that we have in Scotland. And speaking with a personal interest in hill farming, I think one area of, of major concern I have is the sort of the latent, if you like, environmental management of extensive farming systems that we have in, in Scotland. Whilst there'll be an awful lot of focus on intensive land management, uh, looking at some very specific issues across the UK, I think there's always a danger that, that, that the, the benefits uh, of uh, uh, and future benefits that we can derive both socially and environmentally as well as economically from looking after our hills and uplands could be one area where Scotland will need to bat pretty hard going forward because it's not the same issue in other parts of the United Kingdom. Presumably with the support of the NFUS. Absolutely. Thank you. Briefly, Finlay Carson. It, it, I feel that uh, there, there's a consensus that the, the, the Scottish government is some, somewhere behind the, the, the wheel and they're, they're, they're playing catch-up. Would it not be uh, a, a better scenario where the Scottish government actually worked closer with NGOs to find the perfect model to deliver environmental or agricultural policy in Scotland and then use that to ensure that the UK framework actually fits it, rather than waiting to see what the UK framework is and potentially uh, compromising what the ideal model is in Scotland. So are we actually, it's, it's, it's almost chicken and the egg, but are, are, are we getting it in the right order? Should we not be formulating what our ideal model is and using that to inform how the, the UK framework should be built up? Uh, I, I think um, w one observation I would make is that you very quickly said agricultural or environmental policy. I think we all need to get in the habit of saying that those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and I think that's where Scottish Government could take a lead uh, by developing policy with a whole range of stakeholders and actually saying we, we've got a lot of common interest here. If we get this right, we can start to set the agenda. Uh, and it, it'll certainly be reflective of, of Scotland's wider needs. Uh, but then Arguably, it can then take its place within uh, the UK context as well. Um, and I, I, I think, yes, there are initiatives, there are thinking going on, but as I said earlier on in response to 
question from this side. Um, that needs to be taken up a notch altogether now. We need something tangible to come out pretty quickly. Um, uh, there's a lot of posturing going on, clearly, um, but that's not getting us to where we need to be. I think most of the comments that have been made so far have, um, about where the UK government is leading have been in the context of talking about the agriculture environment um, intersection. And I mean, the, I didn't, I'm not an, I don't know much about agriculture, but my UK colleagues also thought Mr. Gove's speech would, had many welcome elements to it in terms of what it said about agriculture. But so for purely for the sake of balance, um, to kind of point out two reasons, well, actually three reasons why I think uh, where Scottish government is either leading or and why I think there's an impasse just in general. So firstly, I think where Scottish government, have, an area where Scottish government have been quite strong is saying, is saying, um, is talking about the environmental principles with a capital P. Um, and that's an area where I think they've led the, the UK government. So Scottish government, uh, Rosanna Cunningham has been very clear that she wants, she's very committed to the environmental principles with a capital P. She wants to see them continue uh, in in Scotland. Um, in contrast, the UK government have um, been happy. We've pointed out that the withdrawal bill, bill doesn't sort of copy and paste the environmental principles because they're in the treaties in the same way that the withdrawal bill copy and pastes everything else. So the, the, we're effectively using the, losing the status uh, of the principles as they currently stand. Um, I think the Scottish, you know, we should be the ideal solution is we get those environmental principles into that withdrawal bill by the time it, it goes through. Finally, uh, the more that um, Scottish interests can say that that's a red line, but the alternative is that we we do this unilaterally and we we legislate for the environmental principles in in some way on our own as Scotland. But the, the, the most desirable solution is we do it happens everywhere. Um, Another, I suppose the, the other issue is that the, the Scottish Government have been saying that one, the solution here is to membership of the single market or closer to the single market, that sort of thing. Um, on the factual basis, what if, if, we are, if we follow the Norway model, whether you think that's a likely model to happen or not, but if we were to follow the Norway model in terms of our relationship with the, the EU, we'd have to follow almost all environmental um, regulation legislation that's, that's developed in the EU. CFP and CAP are treated slightly diff differently. Um, but even in the, the, the fisheries policy area, um, Norway follows and actually decides to exceed most fisheries regulation, re legislation, that sort of thing, in terms of the kind of environmental element to them. Um, and then the very last uh, um, note, it's escaped me. Don't worry. OK, thank you for that. Um, just to wrap this up, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to turn our, our minds back very briefly, please, to any real sort of top-line comments on um, enforcement um, arrangements, which I appreciate are difficult because we're not really at all clear what the common framework arrangements will be. But um, if there are any initial comments, you know, for, that the, the committee can make, the, the panel can make, um, particularly on monitoring arrangements prosecuting rights and court structures. Any comments at all? And if you've already said something, uh, just in terms of time, uh, we've noted it, but if any, anyone wants to comment further, please. We would want, we would favor um, the introduction of environmental courts in Scotland as one of the ways to address the governance gap um, and sort of provide perhaps the necessary kind of motivation for people to keep to the law. I think on the monitoring and reporting side, there can be a variety of solutions already, and I think it's important to highlight we do have UK wide coordination on some aspects of monitoring and reporting when you know it's important for scientific and practical purposes, so the, the functions of the JNCC. Um, so I think what we probably need to do is um, assess the types of functions that we will be missing out from leaving the EU, assess which ones we want to maintain uh, in Scotland and across the UK, and then come at an agreement of what would be most practical, better for the environment, and kind of make sense from a wider impact assessment point of view. Um, but pre presumably, Johnny Hall and Andrew Midgley, you'd want to see that environment court work more uh, timelessly than the land court, which you would both have experience of. <laughs> I would, would, would prefer not to see it have to work very often um, in terms of, uh, and this is, a, I think, a very serious point in that, um, you know, our agencies, SNH and SEPA, uh, 
Uh, particularly, SEPA have adopted a very different role, certainly with uh, farmers and land managers over the last three, four, five years. And I think it's been very effective and very positive in one of, that it's not been about enforcement and the rule book uh, when there's been breaches and, and compliance issues, but more about education and advice. So we're taking farmers and land managers out of that confused, non-compliant state rather than criminal state and, and getting them into that better place uh, and therefore they're delivering on a whole raft of, of environmental requirements. Um, so, you know, I, I see any legal system as being required, but you, it, it should be there as a last resort. The focus and attention should be on, on good advice uh, and um, effective strategies to, to allow remedies to be put in place uh, before we actually uh, start to take people to, through a court system, which doesn't actually benefit the environment. Let's try and educate and seek out good practice and best practice. And that's, that's how we should start to gear our environmental m measures within future agricultural policy and so on. Okay. Just to clarify, I don't think there's any disagreement oh, there, I of course. Courts would be the last resort, and I think what we're talking about is a kind of different accountability sort of bodies that would allow greater awareness of, you know, regulatory responsibilities before you resort to that. And indeed, the EU system does exactly that. So I think this is the kind of aspect we'd want to replicate. But just to highlight that at the moment, Scotland is not compliant with the Aarhus Convention in terms of the, fa the limitations it imposes on judicial review. So actually, environmental courts are a solution to an existing issue, but would also go some way to helping at the governance aspect as well, the okay. governance gap. Isabel Mercer. Daphne just touched on it, but linking this to your earlier point about judicial review, um, an environmental court or environmental commission, one of the key elements is that it would offer merits-based reviews and access to independent expert um, environmental judges and specialists, which would be key. Yeah, and one final question from John Scott. Um, thank you, and declaring interest as a member of NAFUS. Um, can I just ask if anyone can speculate on, I mean, one of the themes that's developed here is that the Scottish Government needs to come forward with its own plan because we're lagging behind. We have our own unique landscapes, our own unique environment, our unique agriculture and our unique needs. Can any, I mean, others have come forward with a plan, NFUS have a plan, Scottish Land and Estates have a plan, others have plans. Can anyone tell us what they think the logjam is with the Scottish Government and why they're not coming forward with a plan? in the close uh, discussions that you've had with Scottish Government officials, apparently, all of you? Uh, Robin Parker. I think another thing that, that is causing the impasse, and it's the elephant in the room, and I can't believe I'm the first person to mention it, but it is the withdrawal bill. And why I think it, it's understandable that that, is, that has um, created an impasse is because what it, say, what it says about the development of common frameworks I think is quite important. So, um, trying to explain that comment, um, the, the the issue with how the as I've heard, I think as ministers coming to the finance committee and UK government ministers coming to the finance committee have said with with the withdrawal bill, some of the thinking behind it in terms of you take those EU common frameworks effectively, and as I kind of understood it in the way they were describing it, you kind of corral them at the UK level and they maintain UK competences until a common framework is developed and agreed between the different governments and stuff, and then you work out what are, lies in each place, which is, which sounds fine, it, it, so long as that's a happy process where everyone agrees and stuff. I think the, the legitimate concern is what happens if things aren't agreed, and then that thing's corralled away at, at, at UK level. Whereas if um, the alternative, um, where this parliament seems to be headed, is that, the ult that you sort of, as it were, the common frameworks go back to the devolved level, and then we work together to create common frameworks to kind of build them up from in that way sort of thing. So I think the, the regrettable thing here is that this that that is inevitably, because I, th I think the issue is different people have been able to put forward their vision and their perspective and argue their case sort of thing. That's not the problem. That's not the thing that, that's missing. The problem is peop is the coming together and negotiating and developing those it's in the together. previous session. I think it's, it's not exactly trust that I'm, I'm picking on. I think it, it's the, the developing together. The, it, the, the issue is how we manage our, our shared resources to, together. So you can't, people, great, you're, you've got your starting point, different visions, but where does that end up? With? Because there are differences in those, those visions. So the process and the, the itty bitty of working out and having the disagreements and stuff is, is important. And what I think I'm saying is that the, the withdrawal bill has, 
has stopped that process from really starting in earnest because we're back at fundamental constitutional issues and the urge is that we, we they, those need to be figured out so that we can get into the meat all of us stakeholders parliamentarians governments of negotiating the meat thank you for that anyone else believe we I would echo Robin's points. I think some of the academics um, explicitly mentioned the issues with Clause 11 um, in their submissions. I think perhaps what we can look forward to is once um, relevant amendments are submitted in the House of Lords uh, in terms of how we resolve the differences of opinion um, between sort of Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament as well and um, the UK Government. I think once perhaps that issue is resolved, we'll be able to move forward in a much more constructive manner. Um, but again, where the powers lie and all of that do flavour and colour uh, any discussions we're having on UK frameworks or common frameworks and the relevant governance bodies. It's not just the Scottish Government that's got concerns. And the Welsh, the, indeed. And the Welsh as well. Andrew Midgley, did you want to come in briefly? Yeah, it, um, it was just to um, touch on the, the issue about is the relationships between governments has an interplay on the on the way or the, the extent to which the Scottish Government has gone forward. And, and it brings up the, the word that you raised there, which is trust. I get the sense that the, the Scottish Government um, hears some of the pronouncements from Westminster and then has to spend a huge amount of time trying to work out what it actually means and then work behind the scenes to get the detail that would enable them to formulate a position. So there, are, there are, while the Scottish Government isn't necessarily, um, you know, it doesn't look and appear to be as far ahead in its thinking, um, there are things that sort of sort of mitigate some of that. There, there, there is some um, sort of reticence to develop the thinking until we know more about the shape of where things might be going. And again, there's a degree of logic to that, but it's not necessarily stopping DEFRA, and, and the worry is that they're going to shape that conversation if we're not at that table. Um, can I thank all of you for your time this morning? I think that's been an incredibly useful contribution. Um, we're going to move on to the next item in the agenda. I'm going to uh, suspend briefly to allow the panel to leave. Thank you. Welcome back. We now move to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation, uh, specifically the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 
2017 forward slash 451. Further details on this negative instrument can be found in paper three. And I ask members if they wish to make any comments on this instrument. Mark Ruskell. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, I wouldn't want to significantly delay this statutory instrument um, passing through Parliament, but I do believe that there are a number of questions uh, and, and a degree of clarity that's required about this change, um, particularly in, in terms of how uh, significant adverse effect is dealt with in the environmental assessment process. Um, I understand that the Minister uh, has indicated his intention to, to ask, answer questions um, from the committee and, and to come before this committee. So uh, I would look to you to, to see what options there are for us to get more clarity as to uh, what the statutory instrument is intended for, um, how the EIA process uh, actually works, and uh, what, what are we actually talking about in, in relation to changes to uh, offshore wind farm consents that, that may be considered under this uh, simplified regulatory process that's being proposed. Okay. Anyone else? Richard Lyle? Yeah, I noticed that actually it's actually four large-scale uh, offshore wind farm projects which have which received consent in 2014, October, faced various serious delays uh, due to the judicial review. But also in his letter, he says that Paul Wheelhouse says, I want to make it clear that he regrets the necessity to breach the 28-day rule which ordinarily gives time for the committee to consider the instrument. He acknowledges this far, as, this far from ideal. Maybe it's a case that, uh, as uh, my colleagues suggest, Mark Ruskell, that we ask the Minister along to have a discussion at some point. But I support the, the instrument. It's worth saying for the record that the Minister proactively wrote to the committee to make that offer if we wanted to avail ourselves of the opportunity. Uh, Finlay Carson, do you want to say something? No. Uh, Claudia Beamish. I, I would support what Mark Ruskell has said, and I think um, in the interest of sustainable development in our marine environment, it would be helpful if the Minister could come uh, before the committee, as, as he has indeed offered, because it's an issue of the balance and appropriateness, of, obviously, of environmental protection and the an, uh, analysis of that, um, coupled with um, our climate change targets and how we take those forward in terms of offshore wind. So I do think it's a very important issue and, and there is public interest in this. So I think it would be helpful if the Minister came before us. Okay. I don't want to in any way delay any instrument okay. though. Okay. So, so the sense of the, that I get from the committee is we want to write to the Minister and uh, invite him to uh, come along and answer the valid questions that are being raised here today, but that we don't wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument at this stage. Is that the case? We would agree on that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. So, at the next meeting of the committee on the 30th of January, uh, we would expect to consider oral evidence from the uh, Scottish Association for Marine Science on its report on the environmental impact of salmon, salmon farming. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. <laughs>